Sean was out at the Oklahoma Black Mass down in Oklahoma City where um, Brother Alan, we believe he's a brother, he doesn't believe that we are, at least he's made heavy accusations to the contrary, um, came to Brother Shane, who is a brother, absolutely, 100%, and, um, and, and made some accusations of, of uh, hateful preaching, not preaching the gospel. Uh, he knew who we were already at that time, and, um, and said that he'd seen some of our videos, um, and that he had talked to uh, a mutual friend of ours, or I don't know if he's friends with him or not, but he's certainly friends of ours. Church in Roanoke is familiar with him as well, Brother Forrest Switzer. Uh, and his pastor, for whatever reason, even though, um, although I probably have met him uh, on one occasion, potentially, so I'm not sure what Forrest Switzer's pastor would have anything to do with us, but, but at any rate, next interaction with him was uh, probably... Uh, on the phone, uh, Jean-Paul Mesa had uh, re recommended that um, we talk, um, and, and so uh, it came out in the conversation that I was the, res the responsible party for putting out on YouTube the Word of a King, that's my YouTube channel, and so anything that goes out from there, just so Alan knows, is, is definitely my, my handiwork, so to speak. And, uh, and so, anyways, at, uh, at the conversation was fine until he realized who I was and then he wanted to drop, uh, drop the call like a hot lava rock. Uh, so, essentially, the next interaction was a Facebook message that I got from him where he said, it was a Sunday when I received it, said, I would like to meet with you uh, and have coffee. Well, I knew who he was. We'd been friends on Facebook. There had been interaction with our church, with, with Brother Shane here, as well as a phone conversation where, where it became obvious that he was not happy with the word of a king with me. Um, and so, again, uh, he asked to meet on a Sunday. I refused because we meet with the church on Sunday all day, just like this Sunday and any other Sunday. Um, and it is a time of solace. It's a time of rest, not Sabbatarians, but just, just a time of of the church fellowship um, and so that was supposed to be as it comes out later a review a time of rebuke and a time of sitting down and I guess him coming to me one-on-one -on -one and, and this never happened and, and he never offered again a different time and I told him explicitly why I couldn't meet with him on a Sunday but the next interaction I assume was when he was down that same weekend he had recommended for the Joel Osteen uh, preach he wasn't there for that specifically although he did go to it I believe he was there for a debate that was going on regarding abolition versus uh, progressive, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, progressively getting rid of abortion. So anyways, just a little history. Um, that day he accused us of many things, of being wicked teachers. Of, um, and he said that he had had enough of wicked, false preaching and decided to confront our group. He said that we were hateful and abusive. And our approach to street preaching gave other street preachers like himself a bad name. Uh, that we brought reproach and shame to the name of Christ and on other street preachers and so on and so forth. So Allen's made some serious charges against the church, against the leadership, um, against um, us saying that we're Pharisees, we're sons of Pharisees, twofold the child of the devil. These are accusations that can be documented. These are not just... So, something made up. Hateful and abusive preachers, unqualified elders, uh, Pelagians, uh, which, you know, yeah. Uh, wicked false teachers, and um, of course, we'll see if this all holds up during the next few hours here. So at this point, we'll give Alan the floor, where we'll give him 30 minutes. There'll be no interruptions during this time. We'll give a one minute warning for uh, when the time is up. I'll be the timekeeper, and I. Um, and I do not like for people to go over during uh, debates, and so don't worry, I will be fair on both sides, even though I am representing the church that, that's on the opposite side. So we'll give a one-minute warning at that, at that, uh, that time cutoff. Um, I'll probably give you about three seconds to wrap up your statement, and if it's not at the, time, at the given time, um, I'll just run you over and, and let you know that it's time for the other person to speak. Okay, so 30 minutes we'll go starts now. If there's any technical difficulties, we will pause and, and of course, uh, resume. Starting now. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, everybody, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Uh, this is my dad. Um, 
I grew up in Tulsa, actually, and uh, I want to thank you, Peter, for inviting me to your home. And uh, I believe that there's, you know, there's a there's a hopeful chance that an interaction like this one will will provide better fruit than online online interactions, as we all know how interactions online can be, lacking the the benefit of tone of voice and body language and all that kind of stuff, it can get it can get more heated usually than, than in person. And that's that's regretful. It's not something that makes me want to jettison all of social media interactions, but it's something that should be, uh, you know, a concern to all of us, uh, to be sure. So, uh, I live in Norman. I'm a street preacher. I'm an abolitionist of human abortion. Uh, I believe the scriptures are inerrant. I love the King James Bible. Uh, I'm glad to I'm glad to be here to talk to you guys, uh, Randy. Thank you for giving me the time as well. Um, you didn't have to do this, but you did it, and I respect I respect that. Um, uh, I guess a little bit more about my position. I, I try to get away from calling myself a Calvinist. Um, I do adhere to Calvinistic soteriology, so in certain manners of speaking, it's fair enough. Uh, you know, I don't hold to infant baptism. I don't hold to Calvin's doctrine of the church in, in various ways. So. That for, for those and kind of related reasons to that, I kind of get away from Calvinist. I prefer the term monergist, but for the purposes of this conversation, I, it's relevant enough, so it's fine. I won't be, I won't be upset if you call me a Calvinist. Um, also a compatibilist, uh, which is distinguished from fatalist or a uh, determinist. There are significant differences between the two. I know the term does not appear in the Bible. None of those terms appear in the, in the Bible of any translation that I'm aware of. Um, but they, uh, much like the word trinity, you know, they... It depends on how well a term maps onto the doctrine that, a Bible, that the Bible teaches, uh, as far as you know how, uh, whether we should hold to it, etc. So, as far as why I'm here, why why did I decide to take part in this? Why did I assume, why did I decide to come to this place that I've never been to? And uh, obviously, we don't have a you know a great relationship starting off. But the reason I'm here, and you may find it hard to believe, but I do have love for all of you. Uh, I am here in love, and I'm here because I desire uh, that all of you walk in the truth. I desire that every single one of you loves the Lord Jesus Christ and follows Him so closely and knows His forgiveness in all things and uh, walks in the light, walks by faith, and uh, you know, uh, correctly understands what the Bible has to say about all manner of life, all manner of godliness, all manner of doctrine, and that we all follow the Lord Jesus Christ together. Um, I would love uh, nothing more than actually to unite with all of you, even though I don't live here, you know, but to like be, you know, be something like where, where we're like-minded and where we could uh, actually like go out and preach the gospel side by side together on the street rather than a more adversarial relationship. I don't want that at all. It's not anything that I love, desire, or intend. Um, it's something that I believe has been uh, forced on me. So uh, my heart is to be like Paul instructed Timothy to be in Second Timothy chapter two, and I'll read that uh, verse twenty-four starting. It says the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I'm here because I am grieved to observe sin in the midst of you, it's great, that it's unre and it's unrepented of, and it grieves me to say that. I, uh, in no way and under no circumstances do I desire to push anybody down um, and lift myself up at their expense. That's the last thing from my mind. And I, uh, whether you find it hard to believe, I can't help it. I, I, I pray that it would be clear to you that the Lord would make it clear in my heart in that. Um, I know it can be a little difficult when a relationship is more adversarial, but that's, that, is, that is the truth and it's, it is my heart. Uh, in those who go out on the street to preach, give us what I observe from your videos and in person uh, and what I'm calling out. Um, I mean, I see, I see in, just to, just to give a caveat real quick, I don't believe that there are two, uh, only two positions at work here. It's not like it's wrong always to call out sin and error, or it's never right, or like it's, it's right always to do it. It depends on, you know, whether the, uh, whether the estimation, whether the assessment of the action in question is correct. Is it biblical? Is it done with, uh, you know, with consistent motive? Is it done with consistent uh, application to biblical truth? So all of that matters in a rebuke. A rebuke is a, I mean, it's a weighty thing. It's something that we shouldn't take lightly. What I see from far too many of you, far too many, of the, uh, far too much of the time, is a uh, uh, far too often you're harsh, you berate people, uh, quickness to anger, violating James chapter one, which I'll read in a moment, slowness to hear, quickness to wrath. 
Now, I'm not saying here, I'm not saying that I have never been like that. Uh, I have actually. And I desire to walk in repentance. I think that's the, that's the biblical call for all of us, is to walk in repentance, to walk by faith, to cast aside the flesh, and uh, you know, to every day be putting on the new man and casting off the old man. The old man is quick to anger. He's slow to hear. He's quick to wrath. But God desires us to put on the new man. James chapter 1, verse 19, beginning, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Until verse 11. It says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ in this. We're to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Excuse me. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be a sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, of course, I'm not trying to say that this means never speak in a way that some might consider harsh. I'm not trying to say that. Of course not. I'm not trying to say never call someone a child of the devil or laugh at hypocrisy. Uh, I'm not saying that either. Here's what I am saying. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 and 5. These two verses in quick succession, right, one right after the other. It says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. Why, why the two together? Why one right after the other? It's to show us that not all situations are the same. We can see that if we, if we look at the, the scripture, all of the, all of the narratives, the encounters between godly men and sinners all throughout the scripture, you see, this at, you see this at work, you see discernment, you see a heart of wisdom, a mind of wisdom, working itself out, understanding what the time is, understanding who you're talking to, or who the godly person in scripture rather is talking to, What's going on? What's the background? What's the context? Why is why did the why did the godly person, the prophet, the apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, why did He choose this particular way to talk to this particular person? Why is that? It's because of discernment. And so my plea to you today, partly, is my friends to show some discernment, please. I don't see a lot, and it grieves me to see it. I, I pray that you'll understand who you're talking to, just as Jesus and the other godly men in Scripture did. Luke chapter 6, verse 31, uh, says, and, and as ye would that men should do to you, do, you also, uh, sorry, do ye also to them likewise. That's Luke 6, 31. That speaks not only to the content, the substance of your interaction with other people, uh, and communication with other people, but also, with, also the manner in which we do it. Okay? Obviously, we can sit here and say, man, if, I mean, if I were lost in sin and darkness, I would prefer that somebody come and rebuke the fire out of me. And that's true. I understand the, the sentiment behind that. I understand that 
uh, I mean, I wish I had met some, you know, bold preachers of the gospel when I was uh, a young atheist, when I was 15, and, you know, spitting, uh, spitting blasphemy against God, and, you know, saying he doesn't exist, and being like, oh, where did all this world come from, huh? You know, just, I've, I've said ridiculous things, foolish things, when I didn't know Jesus. And when the Lord saved me, I understand the illumination of the mind and the, the opening of the eyes that occurred at that time, like, wow, now, all, everything is different. I read the scripture, I'm like, this is actually true, and Jesus has authority to say stuff that I should do. That is great. The understanding of kind of the, the emergence of the, uh, the understanding of difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, like 1 Corinthians 1 through 3 talk about. So what we're seeing is, like, again, not only the substance of communication, but the manner in which it's done. Okay. Um, when I think about when I think about more along these lines, I think about Jesus saying in Matthew chapter five, "The meek shall inherit the earth." And I go back a lot of the time to Second Corinthians chapter five, as as read earlier. Are we are we beseeching? Are we pleading with people? Just as the godly men of Scripture treated different people different ways in different circumstances, so should you. So should I. We should all do that. Okay. So I pray that you'll ask yourself and examine yourselves today as you run so quickly to calling people those names and berating them, as you cry out your judgment so harshly without pleading or persuading, at least, to my, at least to my observation, in what way are you being like the Lord that you claim to follow? That's the question we all have to ask, and I pray you'll ask it of yourselves today. No matter what you think of me, I pray you'll ask it of yourselves. I'll give you some personal examples. In recent interactions, um, here is what some among you have said to me. Uh, quote, go back to the sandbox, kiddo, end quote. Quote, we'll give you 30 minutes on Sunday to phone in and teach the church whatever you want to. Game? Doubt it, big boy. End quote. Quote, had a real good laugh over the hypocrisy you displayed as you yelled, Sinner, 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 in that whiny voice of yours. End quote. My voice is kind of whiny, also kind of nasally, especially when I've got allergies, like today. My friends, the content of this stuff is grievous. This is not the way that God ever talks to people in Scripture, ever. Jesus never talked to people this way. Elijah didn't even talk to people this way. There was like actual content and context behind the reasons why the, 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 the instances of laughter or mockery or, um, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, even insults we could even say if we wanted to. Um, there's stuff behind it, and it's all cutting for a reason. It's all showing people something. It's trying to guide them to something that they need to understand. But where is that? Go back to the sandbox, kiddo. Uh, your whiny voice. Like, I don't see anything in any of those sorts of expressions that is going to lead <clears throat> to a biblical sort of understanding. Similarly, uh, out on the street when preaching, somebody walks by and maybe you know rolls their eyes or they give a they give a, an indication that they don't agree or whatever. Uh, so quickly you're switching to yelling, you know, child of the devil and you know, keep sinning, sinner, things like this. Instead of pleading and beseeching people, you don't even know these people. And I know that they don't know Jesus. Obviously, they, if they knew Jesus, they wouldn't react that way, most probably. I know. I get it. I'm a street preacher, too. I feel you. But we can't, we can't be like Jesus and treat people in such, a, in such a cavalier manner as that. I'm calling you to love something better. Jesus is concerned with the heart and not with shallow knockdowns. Okay? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So, if we, don't fa if we fail the test of our self-examination, that's actually mercy from the Lord. Then we can understand, oh, I really do need to repent. Uh, Hebrews, which we might talk about later, talks about you know, the Lord chastising his children. And if you're his child, you can, accept, you can expect discipline and chastisement from his hand because the Lord disciplines those he loves. So, I pray that you would receive these, these rebukes in the light of the scripture and in the heart in which I present them. Now, as far as our initial confrontation in April, I'm sorry, it wasn't actually our initial confrontation. And I thank you, Peter, for bringing up some things that I had forgotten just in the jumble of my mind. My mind's like a huge bowl of spaghetti, so just crazy. I'm, I think I have ADD, I'm pretty sure I do. Or was it the Joe Lowe thing? Um, it was for evangelistic purposes, actually. I did not actually attend that debate. Um, the debate was part of the weekend's festivities, you might say. It was uh, what we call Project Nineveh. It was an event where the abolitionists were calling the city of Tulsa to repentance because the whole city has blood on our hands. 
uh, for the fact that there is an abortion mill at 32nd and Sheridan that goes vastly unopposed by the vast majority of church people all throughout the city. There, are, there is blood of children running through the streets of Tulsa every single day, mm -hmm. and there's no, I'm not saying violent, there's no spiritual opposition, or very, very little spiritual opposition, especially compared to the number of church-going people and professors of the Lord Jesus Christ that live in the city. So that's what I was here for. I uh, did not attend the debate, as a matter of fact. Uh, just FYI. When I was there, um, when I was on the street, the whole thing is, as he said, documented. I'm sure that you guys have video, because I believe Chris was there with his camera. I'm not sure if he got it all the way from the beginning. Um, I did present on my own uh, video channel all the way from the beginning from my little ear camera, which is definitely less, yeah. definitely of less quality than that thing, because that thing's awesome, but uh, it is what it is. Um, so I do have it from the beginning on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's, I titled it, Rebuking the Pervert Patrol of Tulsa. If that's not actually like how you call yourselves, please correct me and I'll stop doing that. I apologize if that's not the deal. That was what I was told by uh, Forrest, I believe, or maybe somebody else. I Don't quote me on that. I apologize. I don't even remember the source of it. But I did say that uh, Peter does not give the good news of Jesus. At least that's not what I hear um, from, from, when I, from when I watch the videos. What I said is uh, you do give law to people. I believe I said law, 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 a whole bunch. And this and this kind of app, this opposition and the people uh, even even like attacking you physically is what happens when all you do is give people law. I said that uh, in accord with Romans chapter seven, you're actually exciting and stimulating sinful passions within, within people when you give only law and do not give anything that approaches the good news of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Romans chapter one verse sixteen and seventeen. We're not to be ashamed of it. Obviously, the law plays a part, but it's the gospel that actually transforms hearts. The Holy Spirit is chosen to transform hearts through the gospel and not through the law. Romans chapter 3 says, or no, I'm sorry, it's Galatians, sorry, that says, you know, if the law had been given that was able to impart life and righteousness, it certainly have come through the law. But uh, now a law has been given as uh, uh, something different. That's Galatians. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I'll quote Romans chapter 7, verse 5. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto life. Death. Death. The preaching of the law brings forth death. The gospel is what brings forth life. The good news of Jesus Christ, the offer of forgiveness of sin, the offer of the gift of eternal life to be claimed by grace alone, through faith alone. This is the essence of the gospel. It's more than that, but it's not less. And when we don't tell people, we don't offer to them the chance to have eternal life because they've broken God's law and they stand condemned and they're going to hell, which is eternal and will really, really be terrible. If we, we warn them of that, yes, we must. That's what the Bible says, what people do all through the scripture. But with the good news, we give them the good news also. Unless, I mean, just, you know, the occasionally rare circumstance when somebody's obviously like a blasphemer and a mocker, I understand that, but that's not what, that's not what we're running into most of the time out on, out on the street. Said otherwise, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 24, Galatians 3. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Yes, it is a schoolmaster, so we should, we should give it to them because it schools. But it's supposed to bring us to Christ. So where is Christ? People need Christ. Give them Christ. They need way. They need a lot more Christ than what I hear you giving them. In what way? And, and even in this, like I don't see you consistently using the law correctly. Okay, because the law is supposed to do that. So when you, you're actually perverting the Scripture when all you do is give people law, or like the vast majority of what you do is give people law and then mock them when they don't accept it. That's breaking the Scripture. It's sin, and you're committing it. You're guilty. So repent, because the Lord is gracious and kind, and he will forgive. In our encounter, I asked Peter to share the gospel and not the law with me. He refused. He called my request to share the gospel a, quote, wicked whim, end quote. I don't see how that's a wicked whim, to ask you to share the gospel with me. When I ask you to share the good news, that ought to be the first thing off your lips. That's the, that's the one thing that I desire to share with, any, with anybody more than anything else, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The law is probably second place, but it's pretty significantly distant, you know, second. And they're not opposed to each other. Not in that way. But share the gospel with me. That's not wicked at all. It's a false accusation of slander. 
and it's a false accusation of being a devil. Like I said, jumping too quickly into these accusations, these harsh, berating things that you say, it's sin. Childish, childishly, Peter said in a mocking voice the following, quote, Oh, did I hurt your feelings? End quote. Quote, you need to get some red meat. End quote. Quote, get some guts. End quote. And it's end quote. Be a real man. Oh, and you never do it wrong. That's a proximate tone of voice. You sound like John Piper, like you're crying. That was when I started preaching. Um, I mean, I kind of do. I don't really like John Piper, to be honest, though. He twisted my words over and over, which is a mark of false teachers, which is what I told you at that time. You assumed to know my heart. And far more than that. My, my friends, the reason like I'm talking about this is because the behavior exhibited is grievous and it's sin. Okay, It's not just against my preference. It's not just something that I didn't dig. It's not just not the way I do it. It's sin. Okay, So, I pray that you'll go watch it if you haven't seen it. Check it out. Now, the reason, one of the interesting things about this, why it's interesting to see this sin, not that the sin itself is unworthy of being brought to attention, which it obviously is, and it's actually a loving thing, as I'm sure you would probably agree in the abstract, to rebuke somebody for sin, if they're actually in sin, then we should rebuke them if we love them. That's the way it works. That's Bible teaching right there. Okay? Um, however, I've seen people... Now, please correct me if I'm wrong in this, okay? But I've seen at least twice in videos, and once where I remember I can nail it down for sure in a video, on your channel, um, a man who seemed to be with you, claiming in public that you are sinless and perfect. Okay, so I pray that you will correct me if I'm wrong, and it's, uh, it's tough. i got this whole section of things that I uh, talk about, and I'm not 100% sure whether you actually think that you're sinless, or that all of you are sinless, or that I'm not sure about that. Okay, uh, I do want to say this. Um, well, I was given a further indication when Randy and I were setting this thing up. Uh, we asked each other several questions at his invitation via email. Um, <clears throat> one of his questions, the last question was, do you sin every day in thought and or word and or deed? And how long can you go without sinning? So, in my experience, that is a question that sinless perfectionists will ask uh, very often because I have interacted with sinless perfectionists in the past. Um, so it sounds like you probably are. I, you know, again, I just invite, uh, I invite um, any correction on that and I will withdraw all of my statement in case it's not true. And uh, this whole thing can just be forgotten, but... Um, in case it is true, um, I would like to oppose that doctrine with all of the strength that I possibly can because it is a terrible, terrible thing to hold to this and to think that you've actually achieved it over and against what the Apostle Paul thought, what the Prophet James thought, uh, and plenty of other occurrences in the New Testament, which I can, uh, I'll happily give any uh, documentation about that because I did a really, really long article about it some time ago. I hold the law of God in a very, 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 very high position. Because God is, as it says in Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh God Almighty. The demands of the law are for obedience, not only in what you commit, that is, not only acts that you, ta uh, acts that you perform, actions that you take, like speaking of what you are supposed to do. The demands of the law are also against non-omission of things that you're not supposed to neglect. There's way too many negatives in there, but basically the law says what you are to do and what you're not, what you're not supposed to not do. Okay, So there are things you're not supposed to neglect, is what I mean. So, um, a, and I, An example of what you're supposed to not do is you know, don't commit adultery. Don't do that. Okay, Here's something you are supposed to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These two, uh, these two summarize the whole of the law. Okay? That is what we're supposed to do. Okay? It's, so it's law-breaking to commit adultery, to do something I'm not supposed to do. And it's law-breaking to not do what I am supposed to do, which is love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay? Both of those are law-breaking. If we do those, we've sinned. So given that, I can say with a pretty good degree of confidence that I, sin. I, mean, I, I think I do sin every day, absolutely. So do you. Okay? Now, if indeed you are a sinless perfectionist, so again, correct me, your refusal to admit it is itself sin, the sin of pride, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, according to Luke chapter 12, verse 1. I have no idea how long I can go without sinning. Probably just depends on a lot of different things. So many different needs approach a person at any given moment. So many different temptations, whatever. So many different demands and circumstances. you got to react to all of them perfectly, without exception, every second of every single day. 
think that's nonsense to claim. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul, mind, strength, it's delusion to claim that you have achieved sinlessness. It's nonsense that you would succeed where the Apostle Paul did not. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, uh, not as though I had already obtained it, I'm oh, sorry, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. So he's denying that he's perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, not. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Looking similarly at uh, James chapter 3, verse 2, it says, We all stumble in many ways. If James didn't get there and he thought he hadn't gotten there by the time he wrote his epistle, well, I don't think you have either. Now, I'm gonna, I had a bunch of other stuff, but I'm going to skip down to something because i got four minutes left. Discuss the, uh, discuss the stages or aspects of salvation. I have a grave concern. I would love to know um, whether you preach and believe and hold to justification by faith alone. So um, if you get a chance, uh, Randy, I would love to know that. I, I would appreciate it if you would uh, uh, you know, give, a, give a yes or no with as much clarification as you, as you choose. I, would, I do very much want to know that. I hope and pray that you do believe it. Uh, Romans 3.28, among a zillion other verses, teaches it. Romans 3.28 says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, Hebrews make zero sense if one is not careful to hold to that truth. Now, sanctification is just as much a part of salvation of a person as justification is, or as regeneration, the new birth, or as glorification, which is you know, dying and going to be with God in, uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. Your life uh, on earth, your struggle being over. The sanctification is by faith and works. It's by walking by faith. It's by doing things that please God. It's throwing off the old man every single day, every single second, putting on the new man. It's a struggle. It's a fight. It's something that we are always supposed to do, and it's part of our salvation, for sure. The er one of the major errors of the Roman church is to conflate justification and sanctification when they do it in really obvious ways, like saying that, uh, well, you know, I mean, like baptism, you know, um, you're not justified until you're baptized. And so they make baptism, which is a work of man, a prerequisite for forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Okay. Or they think that, uh, uh, they hold to a, a division of different sins. They think some sins are mortal, some sins are venial, which are less, uh, less grave, less, uh, less serious. And so, like, you can work off your venial sins either by doing penance, which is a work of man, or giving alms, work of man, giving an indulgence, or buying an indulgence, work of man, loving people, helping grandmother across the street, confessing your sins to a priest, saying 20 Hail Marys, taking the Eucharist. There's a million things that they like to teach that we do to work off the sin that we have crewed. That is a conflation, a confusion of justification, the seeking of uh, forgiveness of sin. And sanctification, which is the ongoing work of holiness, the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. In no way, in no way do I deny that sanctification is essential. It is absolutely essential and mandatory. If somebody is not being sanctified, then there's every reason to expect that they are not actually a child of God. Okay? There's every reason to think that they are not forgiven of their sin. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's not an infallible indicator because you can't see everything that they're saying. So, here's a call to you. Don't assume that you know what's going on in the hearts of people. Go out and plead with them. Try to persuade them, knowing that the Word of God is what works the power of God in their lives, knowing that when we act as ambassadors of Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Peter. It's the Holy Spirit who is working to open eyes where He wills to do that. But only, see, the thing is, only the heart that is born again can do that. Only the born again heart wants to be like Jesus. And every heart, like I said, will be sanctified that belongs to Jesus. Romans 11.6 30 seconds left. It says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. These must not mix. Yes, crush people with the law, and then lift them up with the glorious news of the cross of Christ. He has defeated death. He can forgive and cleanse people. So tell them reliably, consistently, that wonderful truth that surpasses all understanding. Let it be the centerpiece of all you say. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ.
And if uh, there's happens to be any um, <clears throat> technical difficulties with sound not coming through, I will mute our side, but I'll leave it unmuted for now. Um, but not okay. that we'll be saying anything, but just in case. And um, yeah, that'd be smart to kill, kill any uh, ambient yeah. noise from If we need to, we'll, the we'll do that. Was that a barking dog that I heard? Or what was that? Heard a scraping chair? Maybe, uh, maybe this one. All right. And if you're ready, we will start time now. All right. You know, maybe he really is totally depraved after all. Almost up persuades me to believe the first point of tool. To hear a, a very different Alan when he comes in our midst in the video that he put out. Now he wants to kind of soft, soften his message and do that type of thing. That's a totally depraved activity. You are convincing me of total depravity very slightly. So that was an interesting show. Greetings, my name is Randall Harding. On the onset, and for the record, I want to say that by the grace of God and all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, I am a born-again, Bible-believing, Satan-hating, child of the living God, a Christian. This man has said otherwise. This man has said many things contrary to that, and he's accused us all of being not saved. Unfortunately, that is not the case. That would make that a slander. He wants to talk big talk about assuming someone's heart or assuming or reading someone's heart. Thou hypocrite. This is exactly what he has done. Time and time again. I do encourage the church to watch the video. I do encourage that. We will send the video link to everyone to watch. I am a zero pointer, which means I reject all points of tulip Calvinism. Every point in tulip is a true twist. Therefore, since no lie is of the truth, and Satan is a follower of lies, this satanic five-pointed pentagram of Calvinism is of the devil. That doesn't mean that saved people cannot be deceived into this doctrine. It's funny how the so-called doctrines of grace crowd have very little grace. If you notice that. We think this is a brother. He's got some decent zeal about him. He used to be an atheist. I used to be an atheist. I can appreciate that. He goes out and he preaches against abortion. Amen. Praise God. We do the same thing. But, but this man, with zero grace, about the grace that God could give an alligator, charges in like Godzilla into a china shop. He loose cannon on deck and begins to tell us that we're false prophets. We're too full of the child of hell. And, and we are a cult because somebody's wearing some sunglasses. And this type of behavior is sin. The sin is in your camp. Matter of fact, I wonder how you can see with a long cabin in your eye and how you can speak with that camel leg kicking out of your mouth about now. So here's the deal. We do not believe the gospel of John Calvin. And so therefore he assumes that we're unsaved, we're unregenerate, we're collegians, we're all these type of things. And he comes out all guns I had never heard of an Alan Mirror. Never really heard of his name. I do recall Brother Peter and some of the brethren talking about the opposition that they received. If you had asked me three days ago who was Alan Miracle, I did not know Alan from Adam. You understand? But I went out and watched the video. The video, it watched and also looked at some of his uh, blogs and whatnot. And uh, the video was very enlightening to. What is in the heart of Alan? Because Jesus said, I'll be blood to the heart, but Alan speak. The things that he put in the video, and his need to, to put up this rebuke and say the things that he said. Also, my first impression of Alan is he's in his online presence, he is a scholar auditor. He, he worships scholarship. We call him Automaton Alan, or Autonomous Alan, for a couple of reasons. One, he believes that God has pre decreed. And commanded everything that comes to pass. In our pre debate discussion, he said that. All things that come to pass are decreed by God. I asked him what decree meant. He said, Command. All things that come to pass are commanded by God. That would make you an automaton, Alan, even though you would deny that, I'm sure. And autonomous 
Alan because he believes that there is no in hand final authority in all matters of faith, practice, and doctrine. He would say he believes in the scattered manuscripts. He, he would say uh, that God has preserved his word through all the scattered manuscripts, either in young. That makes you the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And that is a very dangerous position. It is autonomous reasoning and it is fallacious. He cannot submit to one single perfect inspired Bible in hand. It's very dangerous. He comes across as, as a type of man, instead of saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch, he would say, never precalculate on your juvenile poultry before the proper process of incubation is fully materialized. He loves James White, the heady, high minded, proud Calvinist. I don't know what it is about Calvinists, but the pride, he accuses us of pride. And he, he says on his blog that he loves to listen to the dividing line. As a cure for insomnia, I would recommend that. James White can take a five-minute video and dissect that thing for five hours. It is boring. But he's been listening to James White. It's very dangerous. That If that is your spiritual mentor, you're in trouble, young man. He need to pick another mentor. He calls himself a Reformed Baptist. James White calls himself a Reformed Baptist as well. Dangerous. Now, folks, philosophy is never used in a good way in the Bible. Alan's seminary speak is taught to the tradesman, betrays a love of man's wisdom. It's called philosophy. Alan has a big belfry, no doubt. But the bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. Be very cautious about this young man. Satan started in the tree of knowledge. He hasn't moved an inch in 6,000 years. He's still that old serpent. Alan's prophet is hewn from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. With yea, hath God said. You'll find him correcting the scriptures and attacking precious verses of the Bible. Like 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Alan would believe that that is a fraud. That is not part of the Bible in many other such cases. Go. No. So let's pray for Alan. Let's pray for his wife and children. I can only imagine what type of devotions he leads the family into. Perhaps a few rounds of Jesus loves me, I don't know. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Pray for his children. Your father's present there, is that true? Yep. Okay, father's present there. Patriarch, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Listen, get right with God. Get right with the Holy God. You call yourself a patriarch and you raise that? That young man is proud. That young man is in trouble with the Holy God. So get things right. Get your house in order because God will hold you accountable just like he did Eli for not restraining his sons. Colossians 2 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 4 says, In my speech and preach, it was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2 13, which says, We speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You do not see this from this young man. I see a lot of comparing spiritual things with natural. Very dangerous approach to the Word of God. Now, we are two local churches who function as one church via technology. I heard about what he did, uh, but I didn't know that it was his name. I didn't know his name and learn his name until later. Went out and watched the video rebuking the pervert patrol of Tulsa. No one calls us, no one calls themselves the pervert patrol. So, yes, you do need to correct that. Whoever told you that, it's not true. We do not call ourselves or any proper name. Just like in the Bible, they did not. Now he says we are abusive, we are hateful, full of hate. Uh, we, and that's not true. We're not full of hate. We love people. We hold up signs that say love more. We go out and plead with people, just like he says we don't. Somehow, this young man professes universal knowledge. It's a very dangerous thing to do. And so he thinks that we do not plead with people. He thinks that we do not have compassion on people. Things, this and that, this and that. Now he posted on his video, Titus 1, 10 through 13, from the corrupt New American Standard Version, by the way. If this verse is applying to us, then he is saying that we are preaching for filthy lucre. That is a lie, that is a falsehood, that is a slander. We do not accept money, we do not pass off these plates, we are not a professional church. I don't appreciate you applying that to us as a wicked slander if you repent. By the way, the context of 
Titus 1 is the qualifications of an elder in, in the very context of the passage. And this young man is not an elder, but he feels that he could use that verse and rebuke us sharply, sharply as if we were Christians and evil beasts, as the passage says. Now that is a wicked statement to make. So he can come in here all soft and with smooth words. But watch the video and you'll see what's really going on. And so he came out to oppose gospel preaching. Yes. Preaching the word. Yes. He came out to oppose that. That is a wicked practice. And I want to say to you, you say it's sin. I want to say to you, that is sin. That was a horrible testimony to the lost up there. So he posts Matthew 23, 15. says, we are Pharisees and hypocrites. We're making folks twice the children of hell. Takes off this video to show Peter preaching, except a man be born again. Then, in the video, he Alan goes up and extends the right hand of fellowship. Young man, that is strange. See, you're, you're coming up to call us false prophets. You're coming up to call us wicked people. You're going to extend the right hand of fellowship. You're a confused young man. You understand me? If I thought you were a false prophet, if I thought anything like that, I wouldn't give you the right hand of fellowship for any amount of money. Now, Shane shook your hand, but he didn't know who you were or what you were doing. He just thought you were part of the abolitionist crowd out there. Now, he, he did recognize you later, but you stuck the hand out and he shook you. But I talked to him about that. You don't shake somebody's hand and come up to oppose gospel preaching. That's not the right hands of fellowship. We're not fellowshipping with that. So he says, uh, and by the way, he kicks it off with Peter. Uh, saying you must be born again. Later he tells Chris Hale that uh, he can be born again. Well, Chris Hale is born again, which he judged his heart so severely. He came up to him and tell him he was not born again. He told Shane he's not born again. Two godly, on fire, young men that love the Lord Jesus Christ, but you know their hearts. Young man, you scare me. You really do. I fear for you. Get things right with God. Father, get control of your son. Now, he says uh, that we do not offer the hope of Jesus Christ. That's a lie. We do not have the power of the gospel. That's a lie. It's a railing accusation of slander. He says we only preach the law and not Christ in the video. That is a total lie. Of course we preach Christ. Yo, let me tell you something. I have never preached. I do not preach. And I've got witnesses here. I do not preach unless I preach the gospel. I do not preach unless I preach the gospel. Do you understand me? I will preach Christ and preach Him crucified. For you to say all we do is preach the law and never preach Christ, that is a lie. I don't appreciate that. I never go out and I do not mention that I love them. I always tell them I love them. When I hand out gospel tract, I say, I love you enough to warn you, but hell will last forever. We plead with people. I've said this many times. I've got many witnesses here. I've raised my children, godly seed, for two decades now. I get out there and here's what I say. I beg you, do not go to hell. You don't say I don't plead and we don't plead with sinners. That's a wicked slanderous accusation. You need to repent. Now, counter rebuke is very timely right now. Now he says this. He, he uh, instantly judges the heart of shame and uh, says that he needs to be forgiven of his sins. It's sort of a guilty until proven innocent. Then he rebukes us and says, well, you need to get to know these people before you thou hypocrite. He says, uh, he's very mad because Shane corrupts the gospel of Jesus Christ. He does not. He rebukes us and gets counter -rebuke. He says that we arouse sinful passions in how we preach. Listen to me. The truth arouses a reaction that's not always good. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost and what kind of response did he get? That is 
on sunglasses three inch pole. Think that, and you said that he was a coward because he was wearing sunglasses. I think that's strange, young man. I really do. Your father needs to talk to you about that. I hope your father's watched the video. Now, Alan says, all these guys in your church are false teachers. They are leading you straight to hell. They are Pharisees, and you are being made twice the son of hell as they are. That's what he said. Alan then says, he came out to preach the law of God. Yes, you heard me right. He says, I came out to preach the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. But he says it's all, 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 all at the beginning. And no gospel. Now, he says we do not preach the gospel. He calls the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. Now that's laughable because you're Calvinist. You said in the video that you're Calvinist, by the way. You put that in the video. Now you say now you're trying to get away from the name, but you, you put that in the video. I am a Calvinist. And that is very laughable to say that that's the good news because the gospel is to go to every creature. Let me tell you something. Calvinism is the absolute worst news to every creature you could possibly give them. Calvinism is not good news. Calvinism says, listen, everybody, most of you, you've been pre-elected, pre-selected for damnation. God hates you. God abhors you. He shed no blood for you. There's absolutely no hope for you. That's Calvinism. How is that good news to every creature, young man? You need to learn the gospel. You need to learn the gospel, how the Christ died for our sins, and learn that thing well, and get out there and preach the good news. That's more of an in-your-face, hey, I'm elect, and maybe you're one of the elect, maybe not, who knows? That's not preaching the good news. So it's laughable that you would call it good news. It is. The gospel is good news. But not the way you preach it. Not the way you believe it. Now Alan says, uh, I am mocking, you're mocking. That's what he said in the video. It's called hypocrisy. Romans 2 says, if you do the same things, if you preach against, if you uh, speak against, preach against the things that you do, that, that is hypocrisy. It's inexcusable. Alan talks cool and Bart talk on the video. Dude, dude, sweet, sweet. Some sort of California surfing Calvinist, I guess. And speaking of surfing, you need to trade in your theological God for something more useful, like a concrete surfboard. You understand? The theological God of Calvinism is worthless. It is a satanic creation. You must resist that. You must flee from that, young man. We'll cover a multitude of sin and error. So he says we incite sinful and we arouse sinful passions. He says we do not give them the true gospel, the good news. Yet we preach all the counsel of God. He says that we are Pelagian. Let's talk about name calling and things like that. He comes out with all guns of blazing and does that in the video. Read, read, watch the video. In the video, he says, read the Bible. Now, use the definite article to me. Bible means book. He is saying here that he believes there is one book. And yet, if you press him, he does not have one book that he holds as infallible and error, inspired, and eternal, the preserved words of the living God. That is very dangerous. That is fork time. Now, he tells Shane Willoughby that he's unsaved, Chris Hale that he's unsaved. He can answer a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. He professes universal knowledge by saying that we we all we, we never do this, or we're always doing that, and, and you never preach the gospel. Not true. Very dangerous to do that as well. He says there is no love in what these men do. He says, turn away from this man, and he is hating these people. That's what he said to Chris Hale. He, he says, uh, that people need to be begged, they need to be besieged. We agree with that. We do beg and we do besiege. But disagree with his judgment of us. Again, he professes universal knowledge, know our hearts. And then he has a nerve to ask this in the video. How do you know my heart right now? Peter says, how do you know my heart right now that I don't actually love these people? Alan says, I didn't say that you don't love them. I'm telling you, folks, in 15 minutes, you're going to watch this young man contradict himself. I'd be ashamed to upload the video if it was me. You contradict yourself over and over. First you say, they're not loving these people. Then you say, I never said you didn't love these people. It's right there in the video. Watch. It's too late to go back down. It's already recorded. Every hour word that men shall speak, this will give account there in the day of judgment. Let me play back a 
the day of judgment. So you can erase the video. It's coming back. You get the stuff right before holy God. Very confused young man. He said, he said, I never said that you do or you don't hate me. He said, I never said it, but that I do not know either way. So he gets very confused at the end. In Acts 13, I'm sorry, uh, in, in section 13, 13 in the video, very providential by the way, 13 is the number of rebellion in Bible numerics. That's where he says he is a Calvinist. Now, young man, I'm going to tell you, name it yourself after Christ is good. Naming yourself after a man does not give you glory to Christ. You can say glory to Christ all you want. You name yourself after a man. Listen, let me tell you something. The only man you should name yourself after is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can say it all you want. It's funny how these Calvinists say, oh, we, we're going to give the glory to God and call themselves after a man. And they say, our, our doctrine is not man sin. You know, it's his name after a man. Big problem. So uh, Alan uh, says at the end there, Peter's walking by, and Peter says basically Calvinists believe that everybody's going to hell, meaning uh, everybody that God preordains or ordains everybody to go to hell. In other words, everybody's going to hell was ordained to go there by God. And, uh, and then Alan says this, he doesn't preordain everybody, just almost everybody. Ha, 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 just kidding. What do you mean just kidding? It sounds like your conscience smokes you there. That is your doctrine. So why were you just kidding? Because you know when it comes out of your mouth, it doesn't sound right. If you preach the gospel you really believe, boy, it wouldn't sound good. It wouldn't sound like the bad news that it is. So the good news. So you're very confused. And God is not the author of confusion. But of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now in the comments, he claims compatibilism. What is this? Some people call it self-determinism. Compatibilism basically says, like he says, God has decreed all things, the foundation of the world, commanded all things to come to pass, every free will decision, everything, and man has a free will. Basically, compatibilism is when a Calvinist, to cover up their inconsistencies, creates a fanciful word, a phraseology or terminology, that shrouds or hides these glaring inconsistencies. Compatibilism. In other words, two bipolar opposite uh, beliefs and we're going to make them compatible somehow. How can we do that? I know what we can do. We'll call it compatibilism. No, it's confusionism. It's what it is. And so those two are not together. And so uh, basically he's not a five-point Calvinist. He's a four-point, five-point Calvinist. Or a four-and-a-half-point Calvinist. Because he really doesn't believe in total depravity. Every good Calvinist believes total depravity extends to the will. There is no free will. Like John Calvin. So, in Geneva notes... John Calvin called this a popish invention. And, as a matter of fact, the Geneva Bible, the word free will has been taken out 17 times, all 17 times, in large beyond recognition. But he believes in a free will, so he holds to this compatibilism. That gives some hope in a way, though. It's, it's confusing, but what that means is he's starting to get a little closer to the Bible. And so, but it is very confusing. It's also sophistry. That's all it is. Now, <clears throat> Reject compatibilism. Young man likes to correct the King James Bible a lot online. And I just want to say this. If the history is right, one of those King James translators was handpicked by Henry VIII to tutor Queen Elizabeth in Greek because it was said that he is the greatest, most exact Greek scholar of his era, of the entire world, of his era. I submit to you, young man, you're not the greatest Greek scholar even in your city. What's less state or continent or the entire world or air? One of those King James translators could read the entire Hebrew Old Testament at the age of five. If you're like me, you could barely read, here is George goes to town at age five. Understand? One of those King James translators studied Greek 16 hours a day. One of them had the largest Greek library in the world. Now, the question is this. Who are you? If you think you can rise up over this, if you think you know the King James Bible, if you think you know the Bible better than the King James Translator, go ahead and pause a minute. we got somebody at the door. Okay, so
so? How many minutes have we got? Five. Five minutes. So let's just hit a few things that he said. <coughs> Why did out here? Now, again, he says that, uh, he says the Bible several times. We heard it today. The definite article, the, the Bible means book. He's talking about the book, but he doesn't believe it. The book. He says this whole thing was sort of forced on him. Well, that's, that's kind of what it's called, no doubt. God just sort of forced you to go out there and rebuke these guys not know what you're talking about. But, uh, no, that's not true. It wasn't forced upon you. So, uh, he says, 2 Timothy 2.24. Now, he needs to read the context of 2 Timothy 2.24. 2 Timothy 2.24 says this. He's talking about the servant of God must not strive. And it started right there, very interesting that he did. And what you'll find is the verse right before it says, So avoid foolish questions and, uh, and unlearned questions. Okay, so in it says, but, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife, and the servant of God, or the servant of the Lord, must not strive. Strive in what way? With unlearned questions and foolish questions. That's the context. He didn't give you context. Actually, a little bit earlier, it talks about, in verse 14, they strive not about words. It's just uh, that they strive not about words to no problem. No, no. The type of struggle we're not to do is words to no problem. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prophet. We should strive about the word of God. We should earnestly contend for the faith. We should be set for the defense of the gospel. We, we should contend with those that transgress the law. The Bible teaches these things. And so also in this very context, by the way, Paul says this. He says, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's interesting language. That's, that's not unconditional election, by the way. Now he says... He says uh, that, and it's, it's basically trip in the treacherous truth trap in, in the paradoxical penal, penal swing, where he's swinging on over. He says we're too harsh, uh, we're, we're we're too quick to an anger, and these type of things. Jeremiah forty-eight ten puts a curse upon those that withhold their sword from blood. Let me tell you something. Just like he tried to use Titus one, as if you're a qualified elder. To rebuke us sharply, that's what you use. You, you need to think about what an elder is. An elder is not a novice. You know why? Because he has to know how to use the sword. He has to learn to draw blood at times. That's why Amos said that they abhor him, they hate him, they speak it uprightly, and rebuke at the end of the gate. That's why Jether, the firstborn of Gideon, it says he could not up and slay. He could not use that sword to slay. Why? He was but a youth. Listen, when people are not spiritual maturity and sound doctrine like Calvinism, and they're coming out rebuking and trying to stop gospel preachers, there's a problem right there. And no wonder you will trip the treacherous truth trap on that side and go after verses to imply that we should be soft and this and that. Now, you did preface that with sometimes you should be hard. Sometimes, but it's you know, because you have universal knowledge that uh, we, are, we are never walk into the Holy Ghost, because we're not saved and we're false prophets and all that. Very dangerous assumptions to make. Now, he says, a sin offering for us, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, doesn't say that. It says Jesus became sin for us, not sin offering. Well, that's how you handle the scriptures. There's sin as an entity, sin as an activity. Jesus Christ became sin for us, not a sin offering. Very dangerous handling of scriptures there. One minute. Now, one minute. Yes. Second Samuel 22, 26 to 27 says that to the merciful, God shows himself merciful. To the upright, upright. To the pure, pure. But to the forward, which is the crooked and the perverse, he shows himself unsavory. Therefore, he says, well, Elijah didn't even uh, mock uh, in such a way, and, and etc. So I read 1 Kings 18, 27. Elijah was very fierce about that thing. He did mock. He said, perhaps he's on a journey, or he's pursuing, or he's sleeping. And so on. Uh, he quotes 2 
Corinthians 13, 15 about reprobates. Since you love the Greek so much, one day look at the Greek word for reprobate. It's the same Greek word that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, when he said that after preaching to others, I myself could be a castaway. That's the same Greek word for reprobate. Look that up one day. That destroys the perseverance of the saints, by the way. So, this young man professes universal knowledge. I just want to say this. Uh, that means God has left the throne. And that's time. Gentlemen, I present to you Alan God Miracle. my wretched estate before God, the fact that I have uh, that I'm a beggar at God's gate, somebody who required the shedding of the innocent blood of the very Son of God to cleanse my soul from all the unrighteousness that I have accumulated upon myself during the course of my life. God help me, and uh, whatever I have done to make you think that I think of myself in that way, I repent of it and I apologize and I, I certainly hope that uh, that will not be something that people take away with me with any, uh, like, in, in any way that any reasonable person would, would think I think of myself that way. I certainly don't. <clears throat> now about our confrontation in April, I had several thoughts uh, given what Randy said. Uh, I don't think that it's hypocrisy to talk to you here differently than I talked to you in the video. I also don't think that uh, the confrontation was a horrible example to the loss. Let me explain. Uh, there's two different contexts, two different kinds of uh, kinds of interactions that we're having here and uh, out, out there in the video. I had no idea that you would invite me to your place. I would have probably welcomed that at first. Um, but, you know, stuff happens. That's the way it went. Um, however, I was so bothered in my spirit by the way that you interact with people, that I've seen you interact with people over and over again on your videos, etc., in the ways that I've laid out in my opening statement. Um, all of the denials notwithstanding, um, if you don't want people to think of you that way, then don't put that stuff on your videos, and don't act that way. If you, don't, if you want people to come away thinking that you guys are preachers with the mercy of Jesus Christ, then put that stuff on your video. And don't put up videos of people claiming sinless perfection and singing mockery songs that, that are full of just really foolish nonsense. Like the video at Roger State, some guy, I'm not, I don't see the gentleman here on the video, I'm not sure, but yikes. The, the song he's singing right after he finishes uh, you know, talking about his, his, the, the fact that he hasn't sinned in however long, it's, it's grievous. I don't even know, I mean, I don't even know any more words to say than that. So, it is a totally different uh, way of speaking. It's a different format entirely. So I don't, I don't see how it's uh, hypocritical at all. Um, but you know, given the fact that, given the fact that you invite me here, it makes me think, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something, maybe there's something different. Maybe I, maybe I misjudged it at the beginning. And so if that's the case, then I, then I repent of that as well. Um, uh, also, you know, out on the street, you know how it is. Like when you're speaking quickly, you can accidentally make over generalizations. When you know, Randy discussed several times my claiming to have universal knowledge, I don't think I have universal knowledge. I think I have a lot of knowledge because I've watched a lot of your videos, and I've seen the way I've seen uh, men after after whom it's pretty clear that you model yourselves uh, in your in your ministry and strategies and tactics out on the street. And uh, so, if that's not how you want to be seen, then don't act that way. Act a different way. It's really not that hard. It's just a matter of repenting and turning around, recognizing the thing that you've done was a mistake, and asking the Lord Jesus Christ for mercy, which He will give. He's rich in mercy, so ask Him for mercy and turn and repent. Don't be like that anymore. Don't give people the excuse to dismiss the words that you say because you hide it behind all the mockery, which even Randy was engaging in just now. It's totally unfair to say, Alan, God, miracle. Totally unfair. Now, it's probably true that I said you're not loving people, and then later said I'd never said you don't love people. What I meant, you may be aware that the word love, just like a lot of other words like green or whatever, 
can be used different ways in different contexts. What I meant the first time was that I don't doubt that you, or the second time, um, I don't doubt that you actually hold them in a loving posture in your heart's affections. That's what I meant when I said it the second time, but when I said you're not loving people, I said, what I meant is your manner of speech is not loving. It's not communicating love in any understandable way that people can perceive. So change. Repent and show the love of Jesus also by pleading and beseeching people, which you did not do outside Joel Osteen. My confrontation was a horrible example to the lost. I don't think so. Not any more than, uh, than we might think that taking Jesus' words out to Joel Osteen. I mean, I hear the, the same thing all the time from people who, uh, uh, if, out of Joel Osteen, when I'm, when I'm doing the same thing, uh, I'm sorry, when, I, when I'm saying what I say out in front of Joel Osteen, people are like, you're, you know, you're creating division, you're sowing division among brethren. Joel Osteen's not a brother. So really what we're looking at here is a group of people who are sinning and won't repent. And I'm cleaning house, as it were, because you guys get seen as servants of Jesus, just like I do. But I don't want any fellowship with you at this time when you're acting like this and you won't repent of it. So, when somebody thinks that you're with me or I'm with you, then I want to make very clear that that's not the case, and that I have attempted to clean my own house, as it were, so I don't think that that's, uh, that's true at all. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.24, well, maybe, Randy, do you think that uh, maybe the servant of God should strive and quarrel and should not be gentle unto all men and not be at peace with all men, so far as you're able, according to a, a different verse? I don't think so. Paul knew well that there was a huge difference between contending for the faith and harshly berating people and calling people chief names. About Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, I'm aware that you don't do it for filthy lucre, uh, but you do it nonetheless. So don't be like those men described in Titus chapter 1. You do the wrong thing, you don't even get paid for it. It's not like money's a big deal. I'm not saying that money is some great benefit, but you're not deriving any benefit for these things that, that uh, create all this strife and uh, unnecessarily make people so angry and and uh, make you look so childish. Uh, moving on, at, at no time would I ever say, and I don't think I have ever said, the Gospel of John Calvin is something that I, uh, that's not something I would ever say, except in jest, like as a joke, because I like Calvinism jokes, I confess, or like in an abstract way if I were discussing, you know, the theology of John Calvin, or the Gospel of John Calvin in some, uh, you know, some article or whatever, it just, it's not something that I, that I hold to, I don't think, oh golly, John Calvin, so wonderful. Thank God for that. And I don't think that very much uh, any more than I think about Athanasius or Peter, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, you know, the Apostle Jude, whoever. I mean, whoever has, whoever has come down through us through history who are men who have lived godly lives and left godly legacies. Uh, I don't think of John Calvin any different than them. I disagree on with John Calvin at several points. Uh, he calls me a scholar orator, which is interesting because then he appeals to KJV translators and wonders where my, uh, where my credentials are. Um, to question their translation of various uh, various verses. Well, uh, I think that that's the exact same thing happening, so that's an example of hypocrisy on Randy's part, which grieves me to see, so I, I pray, Randy, that you will repent, take that back, and don't say that sort of thing anymore. Improve your argumentation. I know this is like a sharp debate and all that kind of stuff, but let, let this be a chance. Don't let, it, don't let your pride get in the way, and turn away, and don't use that sort of argumentation anymore. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for you. It makes you lose credibility in the eyes of your observers. So I call upon you to stop doing that, and I pray that you will. Um, just as I pray that I will when I'm corrected too in, in, in ways that, I, that, that are true. I'm actually not a big fan of seminaries. I think that a lot of them ought to be abolished, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> I've never been to a seminary. I almost took a class one time, but backed out when I thought better of it. Um, I do call myself a Calvinist when I think the other person won't necessarily know what monergist means. Monergist is kind of a weird, you know, a weird word. Very few people know what it means. More people know what Calvinist means, so that's why I use that word sometimes. It just kind of depends. I do like James White. I don't think he's perfect. Uh, there are several ways in which uh, uh, I disagree with him. Yes, I do think he's actually a pretty proud man. Um, so, anyway. Uh, I'm just kind of going down the list here, and I apologize. You know, we can't, can't catch everything. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I actually did a study on the word, uh, you know, amartios. Which means, uh, which is translated alternatively, sin or sin offering in Second Corinthians five twenty one. Sin offerings just better describes the uh, describes what's happening better in that verse. Um, it uh, the the word sin is easily mistaken to uh, mistaken by word of faith teachers to mean that like Jesus actually changed his nature and became some sort of sin entity, sin hyphen entity on the cross, and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, leading to him, like leading to them saying that like he suffered in hell and all kinds of nonsense. Sin offering is better. It expresses better the ideas of I Isaiah 53 uh, and uh, you know various other discussions of uh, the propitiation by his blood and the, and the epistles to Peter and the book of Hebrews, etc. Anyway, 
Uh, the claim is that I hold the scattered manuscripts, which makes me the final authority on life and godliness. I don't, don't see how that is at all. I mean, it's not like the uh, not like the King James comes from only one manuscript either. It was a collection. It's a collation. People, the exact same process that brought you the King James Bible, praise God for the King James Bible because it's really, really good. Is the same process that brought you other Bibles like the New American Standard or the New King James or the uh, or the uh, uh, English Standard Version. I don't love the NIV, it's okay. Um, so it's the same process. So don't, don't cast aside these other versions or call them sinful as Randy unfortunately does. The KJV is wonderful. God, is, God has blessed us richly with so many Bibles that are awesome. Let's praise God for all of the crazy, uh, uh, the crazy amount of good translations that we've been given. Um, but even, even here you see Randy will say something, he'll quote the KJV, and then he'll be like, oh, let me clarify what that word means. Why? It's because the language is outdated. It was archaic even when they translated it in 1611. Uh, the second time, anyway. So, you know, I don't see a problem with kind of updating the language. Even Randy's doing that. I mean, if you think the if you think the KJV is all that, then why are you even clarifying the words? It doesn't really make any sense to me. First John five seven is it's not just that I believe it's a fraud. It's actually a complete interpolation. So look it up, do some study, um, stretch your mind, and read a James White book called the uh, King James Only Controversy. Look at some James White videos. He discusses that sort of thing in great detail. It's not only him. There are numerous other guys like maybe a Dan Wallace or. Uh, somebody like that that you can look into, look them up on YouTube, weigh the arguments for yourselves. Okay, I'm not going to go through a bunch of you know King James only stuff right now, and I don't even like, I don't want to give the indication that I think the King James is bad. I'm holding it in my hand. I think it's awesome. I would happily give anybody a King James uh, if that's what I had on hand, or uh, you know recommend somebody read it. I just think the language is a little bit thick and dense sometimes, so maybe they should read something with a little bit more updated uh, thing. And, uh, you know, uh, language. And sometimes the King James, since it was since it suffered from being older, didn't have access to uh, their manuscript discoveries, such as the three great codices, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and Vaticanus, which are amazing textual discoveries. So let those let those enlighten our Bible study. Let those educate us as to what God originally said when he when the Holy Spirit was directing the pen of Moses as he wrote down the first five books, and Paul when he wrote down most of the New Testament or a lot of the New Testament. That's what really matters. We want to know what God actually said. Okay, and what he said, he said it in Greek, so we translate it into English, and thank God we have faithful translations. Okie dokie, let's see. Um, Randy uh, takes issue with me because I shook hands with Shane in April, I forgot to mention this. You know, fair enough, fair enough. It's tradition on my part to shake hands, my dad taught me actually to do it, he's a great handshaker, and does like, he shakes hands with everybody, so he taught me to do it. It's just like a thing that I think is cool, and I do it with like everybody I meet, so... But you know, you're like, well, this is a—it's a, a right-handed fellowship thing. That's, that's understandable. It's understandable. So maybe I should stop doing that. It's something that I'll take into consideration. So I appreciate you pointing out my error uh, or possible error there. Okay, I did not say that you have to get to know someone before you rebuke someone. That's a misunderstanding. I am saying that since you don't know them, don't jump to the judgments that you jump to, like a child of the devil and. Uh, I mean, all kinds of disgusting names that, since there are children here, I'm not going to repeat, but just don't watch the video like Roger State. My goodness. Don't say that kind of stuff in public. It's, it's nasty, it's nonsense, and it's not fitting to the way that God speaks to people in the Scripture. So if we want to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ, then talk the way Jesus did, and don't talk the way He didn't talk. Okay, uh, let's see. You know, a couple things just about uh, my theological position. I label myself a Calvinist. I... Honestly, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, they, people call themselves Christians, so that means little Christ, kind of. I mean, I don't, I don't see the problem. I'm just trying to help people understand in a short form what I believe when I say Calvinist or monergist or whatever. Uh, the claim is, you have been pre-selected pre for damnation, and that is a Calvinistic position. That is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, the fact is that everybody is a sinner and bound for hell, and the Lord Jesus Christ pre-selects certain people to save. That is what Calvinism teaches. It's not pre-selection for damnation. Peter said it on the street in April. He was wrong. Randy repeated it just now uh, in, in the teleconference. He's also wrong. So I urge you, don't misrepresent a position with which you disagree. It makes your argument look weak. It makes you look like you can't actually deal with the argument at hand. If you think you can, then deal with the actual position, not a straw man. Okay, so please repent of that. Uh, I'm elect is kind of the, the words put in my mouth. I've never said that to my knowledge. I don't think that we can know for sure with 100% certainty that we're elect. Okay? Uh, I don't know whether God does actually preordain more people to hell than to heaven. I just don't know. And that is, that is a Calvinistic position. 
However, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, um, seem to indicate that that's not a bad assumption. Enter ye in at the straight gate, that means narrow, if you're using the King James, uh, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The Lord Jesus certainly thought that at least in his day, very few people were entering in, and most people were going to hell. But I don't know for sure, because it could be that the situation has changed. The Lord Jesus also said the fields are wide for harvest, and so there's tons of people that might be coming into the kingdom later. I have no idea, and that's not a Calvinistic position, so don't say it, it's a misrepresentation. I don't think that I use the word free will, I think I say free choice. There is a difference. It may be confusing, but if you do a little study on what monarchists mean when they say it, you can understand the difference. Uh, finally, Jesus both loves and hates the lost. It's both. Read Psalm 2. Read Psalm 5. And then read John chapter 3. Uh, but I kind of got 15 seconds. So, um, Sorry. That's that. fine. No, no problem. So it's both love and hate. God is capable of holding two emotions in his mind and heart at the same time regarding certain people. Uh, so, again, glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, may he exalt the truth and humble me where I have said wrong. Amen.
you don't understand what's going on. Jesus Christ said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is heaven is perfect. We do not believe in absolute sinlessness and perfection, as in we're like the Lord Jesus Christ and we've never sinned. We just believe the Lord Jesus Christ can keep you from willful and known sin. And if you don't believe that, you need to believe the gospel. The power of the gospel, you're crucified with Christ and buried with Him, and that resurrection power, you should say, I don't want to sin. Lord Jesus Christ, keep me from sin. You say you sin every day. That's a problem. You have a problem with the word sin for some reason, and I can see why. And also, the fact that you use the New American Standard Version may be a clue. Because it says in the Bible, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, for all scriptures are given by inspiration of God, and it goes on to say that the man of God may be perfect. Now your NASB says adequate there. Adequate and perfect are not the same. When you went to when you took your wife on in the honeymoon suite, if you did, if she said to you, uh, this is adequate, well, you failed miserably. If she said to you, this is perfect, you did good. The King James Bible has it right. Now, you want to bring up some things. I wanted to talk about how I was uh, hypocritical because, because the Lord uh, used a dual-sided sword here. He could have raised up some backwoods rednecks, but he raised up some supernaturally raised scholars. I'm talking at five years old reading the Hebrew Old Testament. I'm just pointing out to you that you think you know more than that. That's very dangerous. There's no scholarology there. I'm presuppositionally committed to the King James Bible, which means empiricism in science I do not exalt over the scriptures. So I am not guilty of scholarology. It's a dual sided sword. I'm just saying if the history is right, who are you? That's what I'm saying. Now, uh, he says uh, that I explain what words mean and that's hypocrisy. No, Nehemiah 8 talks about giving the sense. Nothing wrong with defining terms. He says you should never call someone a child of the devil. Watch the video. He says, and it puts the print on the screen, that we are making people to call the child of hell. That's called child of the devil. He says Christian means little Christ. No, Christian means like Christ. The Bible says, let everyone that name the name of Christ, depart from the name of Christ. The, the Bible says the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The Holy Ghost said to the Apostle Peter, any man suffer as a Christian. And so uh, the Bible says they blaspheme that worthy name whereby you're called. You should be called Christian, not Calvinist. Not even Wesleyan or Arminian. All those things are sinful and cardinal according to 1 Corinthians 3. Now, uh, that little Christ, that sounds like Benny Hinn, the Word of Faith movement. And he sort of accused uh, me of that because he, wanted, he thought he knew better than the 47 King James translators. And he says a sin offering is much better. According to who? Let me tell you something. It's sin. Now, don't get caught up in the recoil school of the Word of Faith movement. They say sin is an entity. Sin is an entity. There's, there's sin as a verb and there's sin as a noun. There's sin as an entity. It's actually in your blood. You understand? And then there's sin as an activity. You confounded the two and you corrected the King James Bible. Sin offering is not. You've got a translation there. Jesus Christ became sin for us. If you're concerned about the Word of Faith movement and you talk about uh, Jesus burning in hell, read Calvin's Institutes. He devotes two whole pages to Jesus Christ going to hell. Do you understand me? And so the Word of Faith guys did not originate that. John Calvin did. You can find anybody talking before John Calvin, let me know. Okay, he says, uh, nobody is pre-selected to hell. We misrepresented him. Well, uh, what is limited atonement? He only shed his blood for some, but they were not pre-selected to hell. So he's denying double predestination, apparently. Uh, he says he, he can't know 100% these he's elect. That's a shame. The Bible says, these things I'll write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You don't even know you're saved? That's pathetic. So you don't even know you're saved, and you're going to tell us that we're not saved. That's hypocrisy. He says God both loves and hates. I totally agree. And, and that God can show various emotions at the same time. I totally agree with that. Uh, Swart, he asked the question, uh, do we believe that you are justified by faith alone? Yes. We're saved by faith. We're kept by faith. We're not saved by works, and we're not kept by works. Peter says we're kept by the power of God through faith. It's all the power of God. 
We do not believe faith and repentance is a work like many Calvinists do. Because as soon as you get out and preach, uh, you must believe and, and, and repent. It's still lots of work. And you're preaching works. He talks about baptism being a work. Amen. Read Calvin's Institutes. Calvin baptized babies. Calvin said, only, uh, only the only the baptized infants are elect. Only the baptized infants of the elect are elect. They taught that in the Institutes. Maybe you disagree with that. Okay, so he says, should you always strive for people? No, you should never strive with, with uh, ignorant and unlearned questions at gender strife, and you should never strive for words of no profit. You've got a lot of people out there fighting over organic meats and all sorts of little things. And don't strive about those things. But there's some things you better strive about. So be careful how you handle the scriptures there. He says the King James Bible is wonderful, and the NASV is wonderful. Now, the NASV has major problems. And he champions the NASV, New American Standard Version. The NASV says in Psalms 8 5 that God made man a little lower than God. Talks about the word of faith, people. They like to use that verse in the New American Standard Version, by the way. Let me tell you something. That's blasphemy. Let me tell you something. Man is light years infinitely below God. And yes, that is a sinful and wicked translation to say things like that. It also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. Sorry, there are idols in the world. That is a wicked translation. There's many such like in the New American Standard Version that he chanted. And I did not say it's a wonderful translation. Okay, so some questions I'd like to hear answered uh, somewhere in the in final uh, clothing, is how do you extract perfect doctrines from imperfect sources? Another question. You champion the New American Standard Version, and it takes diligently out of Hebrews 11.6, and I'm seeing you use Hebrews 11.6, not a lot, and God's pleasing faith is to diligently seek Him. New American Standard Version takes that out. Why would you ignore such a translation? Another question I'd like to see somehow answered if it's not for you. Can God limit himself, or do you deny God's right to limit himself? Another question. In Galatians 6.14, it says that we are crucified, uh, the cross of Christ by whom uh, we are crucified in the world, and the world is crucified. Not to us, not to me, Paul said. Question. How is the world crucified if Jesus did not die for the world? Question for you, Alan. How many people are in the world? You see how the word many can mean all. This is important because God would like to look at ransom for many and use that to prove uh, you know, limited atonement. Question, now, if being dead in our trespasses and sins means we cannot repent or believe or do anything, the way most Calvinists teach, maybe you're different, then Romans 6 says we are dead to our sins. Does that mean you cannot sin? Or, are you taking the death analogy too far? That's the question. So, Tula confuses foreknowledge with foreordination. Let me illustrate. You take a professional horse racing down. Somehow, he has foreknowledge in this illustration. And he knows the winning horse. Who will he select and elect to put his money on? Certainly, he will select the winner. But does that mean that he made the horse to win? Or does that mean that he made the losing horses to lose? No. So foreknowledge is not foreordination. And that is a problem with the redefinition that Calvinists do. Often. So most Calvinists, we would say, they believe everything that comes from Calvin's two lips. Now Alan says he doesn't believe everything that comes from Calvin. Amen. That's good. And he, he believes all the five points of tool, he says, but uh, apparently there's some doubt about some of those points. Yes. Compatibilism. <coughs> but Alan still believes he's one of the lucky lot of elite select electric level automatons of a non existent deal that was overthrown. And, folks, listen, if you want to learn about the circumflex accent under the anti penal and the locket of ending, you need to follow the likes of. Alan and James White, the dividing line, and things like that. But if you want to learn the Bible, you better run from that type of mentality and that type of attitude. How much time do I have? Just a, 
Just over a minute, minute and a half. Okay. So, wrapping up, we're ambassadors for Christ. We absolutely agree with that. We, we are to represent Christ. We absolutely agree. He, he feels that uh, his mind is spaghetti, he said, and that he has ADD. Appreciate the confession. I, I thought his mind was a little bit like concrete, thoroughly mixed up, and permanently set. But it does look like he's willing to say, hey, maybe I was wrong about this, maybe I was wrong about that. Amen. What? Okay? But at the same time, I'm still hearing attacks upon the Bible, etc. and so on. And as far as the uh, the uh, person singing the song over at Roger State, that young man is under church discipline, and he is uh, put out of the church. And he was involved in you know secret, in secret sin, and he was exposed. And the Lord's exposed him, and he's been he was leavened, he was put out of the church, and so he was a very problematic uh, young man, and definitely not a good representation of our church. And so some of those statements that were made were not coming from our church. It's kind of like you get out, you know, you get out there and preach. You got different people out there who are saying this and saying that. And he was, I don't remember, he was part of our church at the time of that preach. He only stayed with us four and a half months, and he's no longer part of the church. I'm gonna make that clear. Next time. Okay. All right. Now we'll. Um... Go ahead, if y'all probably both want to stand, I would assume, for if you want to, for the um, uh, exchange of ten questions, ten answers, and rebuts to those questions and answers. So we'll give okay. one minute for the, um, uh, well, I guess we don't necessarily have a time limit on how long to ask the question, but try to make it concise, wrapped up fairly decently, maybe 30 seconds or so. Um, then give a one minute answer and um, a one minute rebut, I think is the plan. Ten questions from each, ten answers, and uh, ten rebuts then. So we will start with Alan asking a question. You've got, uh, you know, however long you need to ask a question concisely. Okay. Brady, uh, you're out uh, passing out tracks. A Roman Catholic comes up to you, tells you that he's Roman Catholic, and says, what is your core message? Please share it. Our core message is that the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, was manifested in the flesh. He is your creator. He manifested in the flesh. He lived a life, morally kept the moral law. He paid for the sins of the world. He died for your sins. This, this uh, payment was, was applied uh, only if someone repents from their sins, turns away from their sins, and believes, puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. His payment for them upon the cross. He was resurrected. He is alive. And he said, You must be born again. Okay. We'll allow a minute rebut. Uh, I guess, um, you know, a Roman Catholic is not necessarily going to understand uh, all of those words, or he'll reinterpret them much like a Mormon will, or much like. Uh, I don't know, I mean, any, any number of people can, can misinterpret things. Uh, I mean, for that matter, a, a Muslim can misinterpret who Jesus is. He can think of him as a, as a prophet or whatever. So, it's very important to be precise with our terms. And, uh, you know, in a debate like this, it's, uh, it's preferable to be precise with terminology, as we've been both trying to, you know, expose inconsistencies and, uh, and contradictions within the other guy's position. Um, I, would, I would really suggest you use words like justification, uh, and helping people understand what it, what it means to have forgiveness of sin, but I'm afraid that you don't do that, I, not because I don't think you're smart, I think you're plenty smart enough. Um, I wonder if you haven't thought of it because uh, your position is very much like unto theirs uh, with respect to the conflation of justification and sanctification that's inherent in their position. Done. Okay. Question from Randall. Alan, we call this following question to do the body of Christ a favor dilemma. Alan, would you please accept the divine mandate to do the body of Christ a favor and come out with the Alanized version of scripture to correct all the errors that you are able to find in the authorized version and how do you think God will use your translation? 
Okay, one minute. All right. You know, again, I don't, I don't claim to be a Greek scholar. Um, I do. I speak French fluently and Spanish uh, almost fluently. I understand principles behind translation, uh, interpretation, uh, hermeneutics, and all that kind of stuff. I'm no expert. Um, however, there's really, when you really get down to it, uh, the tools that are available to us, especially via computers and the internet, are very strong and wonderful, and they can they can yield a lot of good information. So when I presume, as it were to step in and correct, it's with full knowledge that nobody is perfect. Nobody has been uh, uh, directed by you know, God's uh, auto-dictation uh, during the course of creating or preparing a Bible translation. Rather, what I do try to do is when I become aware of a possible problem or maybe something that needs to be better rendered or what, you know, what a verse is actually trying to say, in sec like 2 Corinthians 5.21, for example, uh, when I say sin offering, it's because that the, the same Greek word is translated that way all throughout the New Testament as well as it's translated sin. Sin offerings better because you can you can check it out you can do the study. Okay, one minute rebut. So again, we see our brother here. Instead of understanding the scripture, he's standing over the scripture. He's usurping authority over the scriptures here. He says uh, that he believes the scriptures. The King James Bible is scripture, and the Bible is all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine or proof. For correction. The scriptures correct you. Now, you don't correct the scriptures. Your presuppositional dilemma is that you're extracting imperfect, or rather perfect doctrines in your mind's eye from imperfect manuscripts. You say to yourself, you may not be elect, but you know what you're saying. That's very problematic. The, the errors that you find in the King James are not there. They're between your two ears, not between the covers of the King James Bible. That is blasphemy to correct the word of God. Allow the word of God to correct you, young man. All right, Alan's question. Randy, you said you're presuppositionally committed to the KJV. Uh, so why, during the course of this debate, have you cited scholars and their amazing abilities? Uh, scholars who are also very, very uh, well-versed in their field, also translated the NASB, the New King James, the ESV, etc. Uh, who are you to correct them? Okay, well, <clears throat> the scripture's correct scholars. And again, I've explained this, that it's a dual-sided sword. The Lord can raise up some backwoods hillbillies. He decided to supernaturally raise up some men. You're not going to see that with these modern translators. They didn't watch their loved ones burn at the stake by Bloody Mary. These modern translators were not reading the Hebrew Old Testament at the age of five. They were not handpicked by a king and said to be the greatest scholar in the world. What you'll find on these translation committees is everything from sodomites to uh, drunkards and all sorts of things. And so the idea is this. I don't profess to know more than these scholars. I profess to know God. And the Word of God is presuppositionally superior. It's, and I'm committed to this Word of God. And it is superior to the scholars. Therefore, it is the Word of God that corrects the scholars on the new version of the committee. That's a minute. Okay, a rebut. Oh yeah, I forgot I was supposed to rebut. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, uh, like I said, you know, ADD. So, I'm not trying to correct the scriptures. Uh, what I'm talking about is the highest authority is what God said. It's not what King James translator team said or the New American Standard Translator team said. It's what God said. So what we need to do is discover what God said. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, for example, when, when, King, when uh, James White says in his book, Invest your energies in discovering variants that reflect the original truth, a contradiction is plain. The, the whole point is that we still have numerous manuscript, you know, manuscript discoveries out there possibly still be discovered, but God has, has chosen the, the process of these manuscripts to help us uh, get the the most accurate uh, rendering of the uh, you know of the original text that that we can possibly get, and he is he is in that. Plenty of people have you know been saved through through reading all sorts of Bible translations, served the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully through uh, all different versions. Thanks. All right, question from Randall. Randall. Oh yeah. Out of thirty one thousand one hundred and two verses in Scripture, can you please quote me one? that you believe is infallible and inerrant and perfect and inspired and how you substantiate that claim? Uh, all of them that were, all of them that were 
we're actually in Scripture that God breathed out are infallible and inerrant because God cannot lie and He cannot make a mistake. So, the question becomes, how can we know what God originally said? And God has chosen the process laid down through the uh, preservation of these manuscripts, um, and then the collation of all of that kind of stuff, and the science and the art of textual criticism, so that we can have great Bibles like the King James or like the New American Standard. So, notice here, I mean, I, I'm sitting here quoting from the KJV, I love the KJV, and I also love the NASB. Uh, Randy here is saying, saying that the NASB is like a tool of the devil, it makes no sense to me. Uh, so, anyway, how do I substantiate it? Because I trust God. I trust God to, uh, to bring the process known. And when I can read the KJV and when I read the NASB, despite all these tiny little things that you can bring up and, and say like, oh look, the NASB is perverting doctrine or whatever, read the whole thing and understand the, the message is exactly the same. Uh, so with I guess with maybe a, a few tiny little differences here and there, but even something like, I don't know, the Kama Johannium is still expressing true things, it's just not in the original text. So what we need to do is that. Yeah. All right, so my question now, yeah? And um, that's no. a re yeah that was my your, re qu your question. Yeah, man. it's easy <laughs> to lose track for sure because <laughs> I just did. Okay, Randy, Galatians chapter two, verse fourteen. Do I do I repeat what he said? Uh, no, that was my rebuttal just now. Wasn't uh, it? That, 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 didn't, didn't, was, didn't I ask a question and then he answered? No, he, he asked you. Sorry, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. Right, yeah. My, my that's what I thought too. Thank okay. you. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Randy. Should keep correct. Okay, so I asked him for just one verse out of 31,102 that he believed was infallible and inerrant, and he could not produce one. He did not quote one verse. He just said, well, they all are. Uh, and never really gave us a good answer. That's the problem. Because let me tell you something. A Bible in hand, a perfect Bible in hand, is better than two in some burning bush, some non devilish entity that is uh, not, uh, not in my hand. And if it's not in your hand, it's not in your heart, it's not in your hymn book, it's not in your home, it's not in your mouth, etc. and so on. Now, pride is exaltation over authority. Humility is submission to authority. But what I'm seeing is that you're setting yourself up as the arbiter of what is right, what's wrong. And you put your faith in the wisdom of men and what scholars and this and that. You're able to find with almighty Google or whatever and, and the uh, lexicon, leprechauns, you're able to uh, arrive at the truth maybe. And it's just a position of doubt. Do not believe in that God is able to give you the perfect inspired words of God in your hand. There's a minute. It's an eight, it's an eight. Thank you. All right, question from Alan. Thank you. Sorry about that last time. I'm sorry. I lost track. Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, Randy. says, uh, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews... Then why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Do you believe that that is discussing ceremonial law? Yes, do. He's, what he's saying is that the dissimulation or the hypocrisy of excluding the Gentiles based on the ceremonial law is uh, to be rebuked and to be withstood. There's a false gospel of the Judaizing that says the ceremonial law is needed in order to be saved. And so he's rebuking them, he's going to stand up in the face. It is talking about ceremonial law, he's not talking about moral law. If you read Galatians 5. Galatians 5 comes against those that are antinomian or those that uh, feel that the works of the flesh are, are something that you can walk in. He warns them that they would not inherit eternal life. So you see two thrusts in Galatians. One is legalism, thinking that you're saved by the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. The other is antinomianism, thinking that you are not under the moral law of the Word of God. And so, yes, it is talking about ceremonial law in that context. Okay, one minute rebut. All right, that is a major mistake. Uh, it's made by Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, all over the world, and I've heard them say it over and over again to me. Uh, there is no indication anywhere in Galatians that he's only referring to uh, ceremonial law in chapter 2. He's not differentiating it with any, uh, any terminology, not in the Greek, not in the uh, divinely inspired King James either, in the, uh, uh, in the English in chapter 5. 
It's law all the way through, and what he's trying to express is the stages of salvation that I was pointing to earlier, and I, I pray that you'll take that into mind and consider well that, if you, that you can't avoid the errors of Rome in conflating justification and sanctification if you think about, think about it that way. What Paul is trying to say, that you're not, you cannot actually have forgiveness of sin by doing stuff. It's only by grace alone, through faith alone. And then the, that person who is justified by grace alone, through faith alone, will always bear good fruit. Uh, good fruit. Because Ephesians chapter 2, for example, says that you know, we are his workmanship created in Jesus for Christ work, uh, for good works. Okay, and question from Randall. Alan, can you please explain why God decreed and commanded every porn site, every satanic blasphemy, every abortion and abortion clinic, every raped baby, Every act and thought of every serial killer, every wicked and vile crime of every dictator, etc. And how this comports with God's holy nature. Okay, one minute. Thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. It's also a very common one. Um, so, yeah, I can't remember exactly where the verse is that I'm looking at, but, um, yeah. That's a problem. Oh, well, anyway. So, the, uh, the answer is basically found in, uh, I can't find it, but in, uh, in the book of Acts, it says that uh, uh, Peter is preaching to the people, and he says, this man whom you handed over according to the preordained plan of God. The whole point is that the cross has never been plan B. The cross has always been the plan from, from eternity past. There has never been a time when the cross of Christ was not the intent of God. To get the cross of Christ and to wash people clean from their sin, is required, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, sin, sin is kind of the necessary uh, uh, precondition for the cross. It's a huge question. Read some, read some kind of standard monergist uh, works on that. I mean, the Potter's Freedom by White is okay, uh, so you might check that one out if you want more detail. I can't answer in one minute. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Rebut. All right. It's very tough on Alan's conscience to try to comport the two. And that's why he stumbled over that. You, you cannot say that all things are decreed by God, and that all things are commanded by God, born science and all that, and try to make that comport with God's holy nature. Now, he quotes uh, from Acts, which says that the Lord Jesus Christ was delivered up by the predetermined counsel of God. And of course, we know he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Of course, God's eternal purposes were to gather all things in Christ. We understand that. But you did not give any substantiation whatsoever that God Almighty has decreed such wicked blasphemy. Mm -hmm. That doctrine itself is wicked blasphemy, and I call you to repent. All right, and then a question from Alan. Thanks for keeping track, Peter. You're doing a good job. All right. Um, The young man that you mentioned in the Roger State video that he was excommunicated, was he uh, called to repentance for his sin in speaking in that uh, ungodly, horrible way to the people at Roger State University as part of the uh, church discipline process? Is it alright if I clarify that he was not a member of the church at the time? Fair enough. Alright, was he, uh, did, so let me, let me, I'll just take it back then, so thank you. Um, did, did anybody talk to him about the wicked way that he spoke to those people at Roger State? Yeah, I appreciate it. The Sunday before he left, he said to us, on the circuit, before he came in with us, he was a very bloody man. In other words, very imbalanced in his uh, gospel presentation, etc. and so on. And that we had balanced him out with our love warns and our love message and uh, a requirement that we speak the love of God. So that was his testimony the Sunday before he left. So <clears throat> many times we worked on him to balance him out, to help him, Etc. and so on. I'm not familiar with the actual video that I, that I can recall. I don't think I was there. Maybe I was. I really can't remember. And so I'm not sure about the video, so I can't really speak concerning that. But his, his activities, his imbalances were certainly addressed from a pastoral standpoint. Okay. I should certainly hope so, because uh, the behavior displayed in that video is atrocious, ungodly, and sin all the way through. Um, unfortunately, it's something that I see very commonly in the videos that you, that you have. It's, 
And that's that's the major thing that has brought about this confrontation today. This uh, you know this interaction. It's, it's one thing, as I as I tried to make the distinction before, love. Uh, it's love to go out and seek people out, and it's love that compels us and all that kind of stuff. And I actually believe that you love the people, that you hold that love in your heart. But the love is not communicated in any appreciable way to the people in any of the videos that I have seen. Not one time have I seen anybody in any of your videos and thought, man, that's a really loving thing to say. Like, he's really, he's really trying to plead with them. He's really trying to beseech them. He's really trying to connect with them, in a sense. And I'm not talking about, like, ooey-gooey liberal stuff. I'm talking about trying to... Trying to speak to somebody as a decent human being and helping them see their sin, trying to persuade them, trying to convince them that they that they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the blood of Jesus shed for their sins. There's a minute, and uh, so now we're ready for this question. A question from Randall. Question from Randall. Yes, from you. To me. Correct. <coughs> If you set fire to a baby, would you not be wicked? And yet, why do you believe it is possible that babies are burning in hell now? And how does this comport with Jeremiah 19.5, where God says, The thought of burning children never came into his mind. Okay, for that. Yep, okay, so yeah, Jeremiah 19 is a very, German 19 is a very common passage uh, used in... He used to point out the evil of child sacrifice. So, uh, are there babies burning in hell? I don't think so. I think that uh, I think that God applies the atonement of Jesus Christ to them by His grace, um, and I certainly hope so because I've lost three children to miscarriage uh, very early in the pregnancy. So I I believe that they are in heaven in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's probably true, but I don't think that the Scripture dogmatically teaches it for sure. Uh, the reason I think that it's not maybe for sure is that there, I just don't see any explicit statement thereby, and uh, the, the, Bible, the Bible teaches that uh, imputation is actually a thing. God imputes the sin of our forefather Adam to every person when they're, uh, when they're conceived, so they inherit the sin and the guilt of Adam, therefore every single person deserves uh, hell. Uh, every, every, everybody deserves condemnation. It's only by the mercy and the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ that any of us breathes one more breath on this earth. Okay, one minute rebuttal. So the parables of 15 are really simple. We've got a lost sheep, lost coin, prodigal son, and all are regarding a sinner that repenteth. These are children who have reached the age of accountability, whatever age that may be. Children are the offspring of God, Acts 17, 29. God is called the Father of Spirits, Hebrews 12, 9. And sin is not imputed unto them, since there is no knowledge, Romans 5, 13. I would agree... With that statement. Paul said that he was alive without the law once, Romans 7 9, which is a reference to before he took accountability before he died. All we like to see have gone astray. So uh, they become children of the devil. So to so even think for a wild second, you said, I think, I, I, possibly, I, I don't know, I, I believe, I hope. In our pre debate communication, you said you really don't know, you, you would rather like to think that they're not. Get into the Bible, it says about children, for such is the kingdom of heaven. There are angels who always behold the face of our Father, which is in heaven. That's one minute. It's the whole thing God will burn babies. Okay, Alan's question. Right, my question. Alan's rebuttal, rather. Is that my rebuttal? Didn't he? I think he asked yeah, the question okay, I answered. Right, right. right. This rebuttal. is the this is a question from Alan. So my question, yeah. Yeah. Crazy confusing. All right. Uh, Randy, where do you see the age of accountability in Scripture? Please cite chapter and verse. Okay, I just gave you a plenty. I gave you Luke 15. It won't say age of accountability, but it's an understood thing. I gave you Luke, Luke 15. You've got grown publicans and sinners coming to Christ, and the Pharisees are grumbling. So he launches three parables against them. In all three cases, it's and to illustrate uh, when a sinner repents. A lost coin that was once in possession, a lost sheep first, a lost coin, and then a, a prodigal son who was once alive, and now he is dead. Deep. I gave you uh, Paul in Romans 7 9, where he said he was alive without the law once. What does that mean? He was alive and then he died. He became a child of the devil. Otherwise, you've got God creating children with devil. The Bible says he's the father of lights, the father of spirits. Children are pure. And if not, please demonstrate, tell us what sins the infants commit, please. Okay, he can do that in his one minute rebuttal now. 
Yeah, as I said, infants, uh, infants are guilty of the sin of Adam, who is our federal head. Uh, according to Romans 5 and various other places uh, indicated, like Psalm 58, Psalm 51, where David is testifying that in sin his mother conceived him and brought him forth and all that kind of stuff. I don't see age of accountability or anything like it in Luke chapter 15, Romans chapter 7. Maybe my next question I'll give you a fair warning. It seems like if we become children of the devil at a point in time, I wonder how we can avoid the conclusion that it is possible for somebody to grow up, they're not a child of the devil, and then they hit the age of accountability, but before they hit, like right before, right between, they're hitting the age of accountability and their first sin, there's an interval of time. If they should die at that time, it seems to me like they'd go to heaven apart from the finished work of Christ on the cross. I think that's weird, but I'll ask you to answer that um, in my next question, so fair warning. Okay, and so then, uh, question from Randall. Hey, question from me? Yes, sir. Hey, Alan, if you were the fire marshal and set fire to a building full of people and then rescued only a select few of them, would you be honorable or dishonorable? And how does this comport with your view that God basically does the same? Well, that's a, if you've listened to James White and he deals with analogies just like that all the time, it's kind of disappointing that uh, you haven't kind of advanced the conversation in that way. Uh, so the analogy in the scripture is a lot more like there's a king in a castle, and he's trying, he's like showering the people outside the castle with gifts, and all he wa and he wants them to obey him, he wants them to love him and be his friends and all that kind of stuff, and he's totally willing to have them inside his castle and throw parties and feasts and banquets and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be a great relationship, but every single time they come in, they wreck all this stuff, they try to kill him, they spit in his face, they stomp on his children, they rip up all the stuff, and they try to set fire to the castle. So. Uh, they don't. None of them deserve mercy, but if that the king actually does show mercy to certain ones for his purposes, which I don't know, that is a wonderful thing, and it's an amazing thing. It's, it shows the bounty of God's grace that He shows grace and gives redemption to sinful, crazy, evil people like myself. Okay, one minute. Rebuttal. First off, if you're a sinful, evil, and crazy person, uh, no wonder you don't know that you're elect. You really need to pray and seek the Lord. Because God's not given us the spirit of fear, the spirit of fear of one of the power of love and a sound mind, and et cetera, and so on. Now, here's the problem, is you're not going down the stream of logic of Calvinism far enough. Because in James White's analogy of God's throwing his party and inviting everybody to be in so good to him, he pre-decreed and commanded in eternity past that they act wicked. He pre-decreed that they attack his children and destroy all the stuff. You understand? What you're doing is confusing. The issue. What you're doing is not facing your Calvinism with that analogy. Alright, so that's going to be a question from Alan now. <laughs> from me? Alright, so Randy, is it possible for somebody who has uh, achieved the age of accountability, um, but in the interval of time in between that uh, attaining to that age and their first sin, if they die, would they go to heaven uh, apart from the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? Please explain. One minute. Okay, so anyone who dies before the age of accountability will go to heaven, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And they died because of Adam's sin, yes. Therefore they can live because of the last man, Adam, and the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's righteousness. And so to answer your question, in that little interim, there really isn't an interim. They become a child of the devil. Once they understand that they've sinned against heaven, they become a child of the devil. There's no little interval between they, they reach a certain age and then there's this little gap in here. God's not up in heaven with a hammer just waiting for that little interval so he can down to hell, whatever. There really is no interval. You become a child of the devil, become a lost boy, lost sheep, or a prodigal son when they were once alive and then the law came and then they died. Now they're dead in their trespasses and sins and they need to be born again. Okay, and there's a one minute rebuttal time. So I guess what I understand you to be saying is that uh, the, the lapsing of the age of accountability and like what somebody's first sin are sort of uh, simultaneous events. It's kind of confusing. I, I believe you're twisting Romans chapter 7 because it doesn't say that, uh, doesn't, it doesn't talk about like sin uh, at that time. What he's talking about is when, the, when, it, when he realizes the requirements of the law, it comes to life and he dies because he realizes the pressure that the law puts on him. That's what Romans 7 is all about. So it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say that uh, you know, when, like, when I understood the law, right then I sinned. 
But even if it did mean that, that would raise the question of, like, why did he immediately sin? Why does everybody sin if, uh, I mean, if we're kind of not depraved by nature or depraved in the flesh? So that's, that's kind of an interesting question. I'll probably ask you about it next time. Question from Randall. Now, and Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, that hell, or everlasting fire, is prepared for the devil and his angels and the non-elect. True or false? And if false, why? Uh, false because it doesn't say that. It says prepared for the devil and his angels. So by that, what we understand is that the uh, that everlasting fire was prepared for that. Originally, as it were, like the initial, uh, I guess you might say, kind of the the reason hell is there is because of the, the devil and his angels. Surely you're not denying that people go to hell. I mean, you preach hell all the time and stuff, and rightly so. I mean, you don't preach it all that rightly, but at least you say the words and stuff. Uh, so I don't, I don't guess I understand the the point of the question. There's uh, far more to the doctrine of election and such like. Than in uh, just Matthew 25:41, I would never discuss 25:41 of Matthew in a discussion of the election of God. Okay, one minute for a rebuttal. Okay, the reason Jesus doesn't say on that day, "Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels and the non-elect," is because he did not predestinate anyone to hell, contrary to Calvinistic notions. Now, that's why he didn't say it. Jesus said that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Therefore, hell is a place of choice. God draws men. God reveals himself in nature through the light of the conscience and through the light of the gospel if a preacher is obedient. And they are accountable for what likes that they get. That they get. But hell was not prepared for them. There's a much better way that the Lord offers for them. And that's why he did not say that, because Calvinism is not true. All right, and then a question from Alan now. Was God justified in uh, putting to death hundreds or even possibly thousands of children in Noah's flood? And if so, why? Yes, absolutely. Because, yes, God was justified in putting these children to death because God has foreknowledge. And God knows this doctrine that he teaches that before someone is accountable for their sins, before they are respondable, and they're not responsible, it was actually the mercy of God. Many of the critics or the skeptics want to attack with what they call genocide and things like that, where God ordered the annihilation of entire races. It actually was God's mercy to, for those children to be killed, because in his foreknowledge he knew that they would grow in this pagan society and be children of the devil. Let the little children, suffer little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Once they reach that age of accountability, they're going to hell. They become a child of the devil. So it was very just for God to kill these children. It was actually very merciful. Okay, and one minute rebut. I guess I have to wonder why God doesn't, uh, you know, just mercifully go ahead and kill all children. Then in that case, because He knows that uh, you know so many of them are going to sin. It sounds like you're saying that God, in His mercy, put people to death before they sinned. Uh, the whole reason why death happens is because of sin. And Romans chapter 5 discusses the death entering into the world because of sin. So people who haven't sinned in your thought, they, they still die. And God, the reason I chose Noah's flood is because it's God's direct action to put them to death, people that have never sinned, to protect them from sinning in the future, I guess. I don't see how that makes God justified in what he does, just because he has foreknowledge. They haven't done it yet, and he certainly didn't preordain them to sin or whatever, like, like you kind of think that I think. So, uh, basically, it makes God look... Uh, I, I don't see why God is not unjustified in killing them, and thus uh, murder by the definition of murder, which is unjustified taking of innocent human life. Okay, question from Randall. Okay, Alan. Do you agree that if a person pays for a product with a good check, and the check recipient loses the check and never cashes it, that the product is still paid for, and if so, why do you Calvinists always cry double jeopardy when we say that Jesus paid for the sins of the world, but those that have not applied the payment to their account must still pay for their sins in hell? 
and I appreciate that because that's actually an effort in advancing the conversation. So honestly, bravo for that, sincerely. Uh, I would recommend that everybody read through the book of Hebrews very carefully because the book of Hebrews presents Jesus as a high priest who is actually bringing about salvation and not just merely being like, here you go, take it if you want. Because the thing is, like nobody will actually take it. It pleases God to repent, and it pleases God to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's a, those are both things that please God. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, no one can please God. It's impossible. Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8 discusses people whose mindset on flesh is death. They cannot please God. Their minds are hostile to Him. They can't. So how do you get, how does somebody who can't please God please God by repenting and exercising faith? So the point of Hebrews, given all that, is that Jesus actually brings people forgiveness of sin all the way through, not just making it available. Now, one minute for a rebuttal. Okay, so, nice little talk about Hebrews, but he really didn't answer the question, and here's the problem. The problem is, he has his own set of double jeopardies. For example, he would confess his sins, and yet say that his sins were already paid for, past, present, and future. And the he would believe in First John 1, that he must confess his sins, and then God will be faithful just to forgive his sins. That is a, a double jeopardy, if you will. In this situation, in this illustration, you can pay for something with a good check. It is paid for. They may not apply the check to their account. Sinners have been redeemed in the sense of that he has paid for their sins, but they must apply that by repentance and faith in him. And most people do not do that. Okay. Now we need a uh, question from Alan. Uh, do you believe that it is possible for somebody, once they're justified, once they've been born again, once their sin has been forgiven, and uh, once they're in a state um, such that if they were to die at that moment, they would go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ instead of going to hell? Um, do you believe for, it's possible for a person like that to uh, do something or change their mind or spirit or something like that in such a way that they would uh, end, up hell, uh, end up in hell if they were to die after that decision or action? Yeah, absolutely. So basically you're saying, do I believe that a person can lose their salvation? I think that's the question, but roughly stated. And so, yes, absolutely. You mentioned Hebrews a little while ago. Just to cruise through Hebrews, well, explain that to you. For example, Hebrews 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. This is the Holy Ghost speaking to them, and he said, I swore by wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And the rest is a type of heaven in the promised land. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Hebrews 10, 26 and 31. Hebrews 12, speaking of Esau, who sold his birthright. And he was warning them not to do the same. And it goes on to say, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. On and on you go. Yes, a person who is saved and born again, if they continue on that road to reprobation, doing the spite of the Spirit of God, committing the sin unto death, grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and thereby agree with a seal. They absolutely can perish. That's one minute. Rebut? Okay, uh, John chapter 10, verse uh, 26 and following says, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them, pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, if you're a sheep of Jesus, and then you go to hell, you perish. That's what perish means. John chapter 10 says, they shall never perish. So, the question becomes, we have a seeming contradiction. Why the contradiction? The answer is that all through Hebrews and various other warning passages, they're there to warn us. They're a means God uses to keep us from sinning and keep us from falling away. And he does that always with everybody who is his sheep, because his sheep will never perish. And so, anybody that you actually see falling away or, you know, perceiving, in a, like you perceive them falling away, they were a false convert. They never had true faith to begin with. First John 2 says, they went out from us because they were never really among us. Okay, and a question from Randall. All right. <clears throat> Alan, how is it that you believe God is in control of every atom in the universe with absolute sovereign control, but he cannot seem to give you a perfect Bible in hand? but only scattered manuscripts and unseen originals. Uh, 
Um, he gave me a he gave me a sufficiently good Bible. It's uh, we have lots of excellent Bibles. So I mean, when you talk about perfect, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that you are uh, swiping at a chimera. It's not really it's not really something that. Uh, uh, it's not really something that bothers me because I know that we have the Word of God in sufficient, uh, I mean, plenty of sufficiency. Really, this is a huge question I recommend anybody to, you know, check out both sides. There's all sorts, of, there's hours and hours of YouTube videos and, and books on the issue. Uh, so, I don't know if I can really encapsulate it all in one minute to anybody's satisfaction, so, sorry. Okay, one minute rebuttal. The imperfect Bible often begets an imperfect life. And here's the problem. We need more perfection than by the grace of the Lord that you can walk in as a crucified, taking up your cross daily, child of living God, walking in the Spirit. The problem is, he, he says, uh, he has a, a sufficiently adequate or okay Bible and things like that. And then he does not know if he is elect. The promise of being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. The word of God worketh perfection in them which believe. If you would actually not be double minded, listen to the four tongued serpent with the Ahab God said, actually believe the pure and adulterated and fallible and errant words of the living God, then you can actually believe that same word to uphold you and keep you from sinning. The problem is, you think that you're a sinner, and you think that you're uh, evil and crazy, as you said, and that you now have the ability to look at the perfect words of God and say, 1 John 5 7 doesn't belong, and, and this word office. Here that doesn't belong, etc. And so on. That is very problematic. And that's one minute. All right, question from Alan now. From me? All right. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> In John 14, verse 8 uh, through uh, 11 or 12, Philip asks Jesus. Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus rebukes him for his lack of faith uh, there, so Philip did not have faith. Uh, why did Jesus not call Philip to be reborn again when he lacked faith in John 14, 8? Well, Philip is a chosen apostle, so he would not call him to be born again because he was uh, lacking in faith. What he's saying here is that Philip is heavy, lacking of faith, and that he needs to get this right. But you're inferring by the question that someone who doesn't believe in Calvinism, such as myself, would think that because he is lacking some faith here, that he's lost his salvation. We do not believe that. Hebrews 6, 4-6 through 6 teaches it's impossible to be renewed again in repentance. So Philip was a called disciple, saved in the Old Testament sense before the cross in this situation. And he was born again. And yes, he had a situation. I mean, he wasn't born again until the resurrection of Paul Jesus. But he was saved in the Old Testament sentence. He was a saint. He was a called an apostle. Otherwise, the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. And he's not. So in Matthew 10, he called his twelve. He put his power upon them and sent them out. Philip. And so the idea here is that... Uh, That's one minute. Okay, rebuttal. You said saved in the Old Testament since, well... Everybody is saved in the exact same way throughout the course of history. Habakkuk 2 is quoted in Romans chapter 1, and it says the, you know, the just shall live by faith. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 4, Hebrews, Galatians, all discuss Abraham's faith uh, as, as recorded in Genesis chapter 15. So, really, faith is, faith is that which uh, you know, brings about the favor of God. Um, kind of in the initial sense, like born, being born again is a matter of faith, being justified, having your sins forgiven, being given the gift of eternal life. Those things are by grace alone, through faith alone. Those passages are one of the reasons why we say it. Philip lacked faith, and I don't think that uh, just because you lack faith in a certain area, you're like, you're going to hell or you fall away or whatever. Um, but I get I get the sense, and that, that was one of the reasons why I was asking to sort of clarify that. I get the sense that you think that. Uh, you know, one sin and you're lost and, and all that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe you can uh, mention that in your closing statement or something. I'm, I'm sorry. That, um, so that's eight questions each. I really need a call of nature break. Okay. Chance yep, that that's absolutely perfectly fine. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's just... Uh...
Second door on the left, right through the door there. I tried not to drink it much before I came, but it didn't work out. Just uh, lift up one handle, second door on the left there. So um, that was Alan's ninth question. This will be Randall's ninth question, and we'll have one more from each to go. Okay, Alan, have you ever met a Calvinist who actually admits to being a hyper-Calvinist? And do you wonder why all Calvinists, when their inconsistencies are pointed out, suggest we are confusing them with hyper-Calvinism? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, they're called Westboro Baptist Church. I have met them because one time they came and picketed outside the church that I was a member of at the time. Uh, and I took a team outside to engage them. We didn't engage them. We engaged the counter-protesters across the street because it sounded like a lot better use of our time because there were like 100 of them. And uh, shared the gospel with them instead. Um, you're asking why, why Calvinist individuals seem to get upset when, when our views are maligned and misrepresented. I don't know, probably for the same reason that uh, you that you're you're upset when you you perceive that I'm misrepresenting you. I mean, it's just it's human nature. We want to be understood. We want people to speak truth, and we, we have a sense of fair play. It's part of the conscience that God gave everybody. Uh, you seem to chafe under the title of, or the label of Pelagian earlier, so it would be the same. Okay, one minute uh, rebuttal time. Okay, a little while ago, a little while ago, our brother said. That I said that God preordained sin. He said, I don't teach this. But he said in our pre debate conversation that all things that come to pass are decreed of God and that a decree is a command of God. Therefore, God commanded all sin. And so, whether you call that preordained or whatever. And so, here's my point about that no hyper Calvinist, no Calvinist rather, ever admits to being hyper Calvinist. If Westworld does, they're the first. They certainly are hyper Calvinist. You know that. The point is this, every time you pin down an inconsistency with a Calvinist, they say you're confusing us with hyper-Calvinism. No, we're confusing you with Calvinism. And you're confused already. That's the problem. And, and so just like you confuse this, you said, I never, you never teach that God for your day sin. You teach all, things, all sins have been redecreed by God and commanded by God. Sorry, but that is confusing. Now you would say, well, you confuse me with hyper-Calvinism. No, I'm confusing you with Calvinism. Yeah. With your teeth, what you teach. So I'm not trying to All right, and then we got a last question from Alan. All right, last question. Thank you. Um, uh, Randy, do you affirm that a uh, that a, a person who is going to hell um, to for their situation to be changed so that they're born again, so that they're going to heaven, so that their sins are forgiven, so that they receive the gift of eternal life? is by grace alone, through faith alone. That is to say, do you hold to justification by faith alone? That is to say, are there any works that are a prerequisite to having one's sins forgiven or receiving the gift of eternal life? I do not believe that works saves a person. I do not believe that works merits salvation. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. Do not believe we are kept by works. The Bible says we are kept by the power of God through faith. And so we believe in justification by grace and faith alone. Absolutely. When a person stops having faith, then they can lose their salvation at that point. That's why the Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. So the devil targets your faith. You are kept by the power of God through faith. When a person turns from that belief, they reach the end of that uh, chastening of the Lord, and they become reprobate. And at that point, there is no chance for their salvation. Now, that can happen at the point of death, that can happen at the point of life. And that's one minute. Thank you. So again, we have somebody who is, uh, again, we have the, the affirmation that one of Jesus' sheep actually will perish, uh, like in John chapter 10. That's just... That's not what the scripture says. Uh, here are the words of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Let's focus on that last part. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. If you've got a group of people who are justified, they will be glorified. If you have the whole body of people who will ever end up in heaven, ever, who have ever received forgiveness of their sin, who have ever received the grace of justification, those are the ones who are glorified. It doesn't say them he also glorified except for those who fell away, or uh, minus a few, or plus a few, or with some swapping out. It says them he also glorified. There's a group that's justified, mm -hmm. them he also glorified. And that's one minute. Last question from Randall. Alan, can Satan do anything that was not pre-decreed and pre-commanded by God? And if not, doesn't Satan fulfill in Calvinism his Isaiah 14, 14 desire to be like the Most High, God, since that we make God the puppet master of Satan? A uh, puppet master is not a term that appears in Scripture. Um, I don't think it's really all that helpful because uh, a, you know, a puppet responds to the string as you move it around. Um, a human makes choices. Now, I don't say free will. I say free choice. People make choices. I'll tell you about... Uh, here, let me read uh, in Isaiah chapter 10. Uh, just you know, so I'll get as far as I can. I might mention this earlier. Okay, it says, uh, verse 5, O Assyria, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation, says God. I will send him against the hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and take the prey and tread them down like the mire of the streets. Uh, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria, etc. The whole thing, he's talking about the axe boasting itself against him, him that heweth therewith. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of God using the Assyrian Empire who freely chose to invade Israel for his purposes. That's compatibilism. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. One minute rebuttal. Okay, so the question is, did Satan do anything that was not pre-decreed and pre-commanded by God? I did not hear an answer to that. Because it is very painfully true to a Calvinist that their position actually means that everything that Satan does was pre-decreed, pre-commanded by God. If you want to object to strings and whatnot, God did this. God commanded this before the world ever was. Now the Bible does say, Moab is my washcloth. So God is able to use that which is evil and, and use that to cleanse his people. And he can, he can say, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. And he can say, in this case, with Isaiah 10. We do not doubt that. That's not compatibilism. That's the Bible. Compatibilism is, uh, is a conjecture, uh, a philosophical notion of Calvinists to try to put two things together that contradict each other. Now, uh, that is a, more of a paradox rather than define the law of non-contradiction as you do with compatibilism. And so, no, but uh, everything Satan does was not decreed by God. And that's one minute. Oh. Okay, so now... We'll have 10 minutes, closing statements for each side. One sec, one sec. Sure. Yeah. Are you ready? Let me know. Okay, ready? Okay, yep. go. Thanks. Okie dokie. Um, so just a little bit more. I, it's true that I didn't answer that last question very well. It's got one minute so hard. So can Satan do anything that's not preordained by God? No. Nobody can do anything that's not preordained by God. God has ordained everything that comes to pass according to Ephesians chapter 1, according to Romans chapters 8 through 11, etc. So everything that happens is according to God's will uh, in one sense, but God actually has more than one will, which is something that you can also read about, which I commend you commend to your reading. You know, further study is always a good thing. Further learning about uh, alternate viewpoints is always a good thing as well, so that you can avoid straw men, uh, such as saying uh, that God has uh, predetermined that everybody go to hell. That's, that doesn't make any sense, because not everybody goes to hell. If God had predetermined that everybody go to hell, then everybody would go to hell. What actually is the case is that God has predetermined everything that comes to pass, and His plan is excellent, His plan is good, His plan includes the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected in victory and glory from the dead. So, the question becomes, uh, uh, yeah, the question becomes, why, why did God think that that was better? Because obviously God did think that it was better 
to have everything happen this way rather than for like the garden to remain unmolested by sin, untainted by anything dark. Uh, and the answer is found in Acts, which I, which I said, that, you know, according to the preordained plan, this man was given up to be crucified. God does everything for, for, his, for the maximization of his glory. That's his driving purpose. Okay? And also for the good of his people, like Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. All right? So, uh, as hard as it may be for us to imagine and understand, God's plan in its entirety is better than any competing plan would be. Because God is totally good. He is totally holy, holy, holy. He is glorious and mighty. Very, very smart. Knows everything. All wise and all that kind of stuff. So everything that God has planned, that his, his overarching plan is better than if the Garden of Eden had never been tainted by sin. Because the cross is that much better. And the resurrection is that much greater and higher. It's the same way that when we, when we preach the law to beat down sinners, we don't go to them and be like, yo, dude. God's your co-pilot, man. Let him be your co-pilot. Let him take control of your life, like a little bit. You know, give him slide over a little bit in that seat. You can stay in the front. It's all good. We don't say that, okay? Why don't we say that? It's because it doesn't accurately represent the the schoolmaster. It's not actually leading people to Christ. People need to understand that they are dead in sin, that they are dead in the law. Uh, I'm sorry, de they're dead because they've broken the law and because they stand guilty before a holy God. And so, when somebody is that low down. They need to be, the, the fact that they are brought up to such exalted heights by being made partakers of the divine nature, by being born again, by being washed clean, by being made a new creation in Christ, and all that stuff, the, the, major, the, the huge difference in between the mire and the muck and the death versus the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so vast, that vastness of the difference gives glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, so in the same way, the, the cross is seen in that much more glory because of, because of the sin and the darkness that precedes it. But of course, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is not just to make people saved. Uh, it's also to build God's kingdom. It's actually to make holy people, people who walk in faithfulness and fidelity to the word of God, who become more like him in his death, who sacrifice themselves for the sake of others, who love God and neighbor, and who stand up against oppression, correct injustice, and who end up building the kingdom of God forever in the new heavens and the new earth. So it's all so great because of the cross, but the cross can't happen without sin. So the glory and the goodness, it all comes from like the redemption of bad. Redemption is impossible without sin. God is a redeeming God, a saving God. Saving makes no sense without sin. So we can see how God's plan works together to perfection, but it's not just by chance. The cross is not plan B. God has always planned to do it this way, and because he knew that this would be better, and people can... Uh, people of whatever stripe or belief can say, well, I think it would be better if, you know, Adam and Eve ever sinned. Or couldn't he make the fruit, like, a little higher out of their reach? Or couldn't he have been more explicit or burned to them when they were about to take the fruit? No, he chose to do it this way because he knows it's better. So, all that to say, I encourage you to look at, uh, if you want to look more at compatibilism, Randy says, it's not compatibilism, it's Bible. So, I mean... You can say that about any doctrine. Any doctrine that you choose to slap a name on, you can just say, that's not justification, that's not holiness, it's Bible. It's really, it's a throwaway line, it doesn't, it doesn't, give us, it doesn't get us anywhere, and it doesn't help anything. Uh, so, anyway, if you want to know more about compatibilism, read Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 20. Ask yourself, who sent Joseph to Egypt? Was it God, or was it his brothers? And was it evil for them to send him to Joseph? The answer is, Yes, it was God. Yes, it was his brothers. Yes, it was evil. And yet, what happened? God brought such good out of it. Second order goods is what they sometimes call it. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 16, the exact same thing. Verse 15, which I, got, I was about to read. Isaiah 10, 15 says, uh, talking about the king of Assyria and the Assyrian Empire. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up. Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send his fat ones leanness. And under his glory shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Anyway, you got to ask yourself, who wanted to act? Who willed to act? Who destroyed Israel? Was it the Assyrian Empire? Was it God? Yeah, it was all. It was all of the above. <coughs> all of this to say, the reason I came here today, like I said, to wrap it up, is out of love and concern for you people. I would love to be unified with you in faith. I would love to walk with you, and I would love to preach the gospel with you. God knows there's few enough uh, partners in the work of evangelism, the work of abolition, of abortion, 
uh, and all the other evils that plague this world. Uh, you know, and so, so so few partners, so few laborers exist out there that it can be hard. It can be lonely work. You know, when you you see a ten thousand people going to a church building on Sunday morning, but you can't get ten to come out with you to preach the gospel or whatever. That said, my longing must be tempered with a uh, a conviction of truth and a conviction over the way that we are to act as holy people, as people set apart by the Lord Jesus Christ who loves, who says that we shall, that we shall be known by our love. And so for all of the times, I will certainly examine myself according to the things that Randy has said tonight. Um, most were wrong, some were uh, worthy of consideration, uh, a couple were right, like the shaking hands thing. So, you know, all of that, I want to, I want to examine myself and repent where I have, uh, where I have made an error. My friends, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith, and test yourselves. Are you known by your love? By the way that Randy has twisted my words tonight, for example, when he said that I claimed that we should never call anybody a child of the devil, he said that earlier in the debate. That's not what I said, ever. I specifically said, it is cool to do that sometimes, and the Lord Jesus did it. So when I specifically say things, and then Randy accuses me of saying the exact opposite of the thing that I said, that's sin. Okay, probably, because I think Randy's a smart guy. I don't think he's stupid. Okay, or that I don't think his memory is gone. I think that he's sinning. All right, and so Randy, I call upon you to repent of these ways in which you have willfully misrepresented my words, twisted my words. I love you too much to leave you without that warning, without that rebuke. And I pray that, I pray that you will understand how, how you bring shame and reproach upon the name of Christ when you go out and you scream these things at people. You can tell me that you can produce witnesses that say that you're actually a really nice, loving guy and all that kind of stuff outside. Well, I think that's wonderful, and I pray it's the truth, because I really, really hope that most of the time you're not actually acting like what most of your videos are. But if the videos actually represent who you, uh, who you are and how you act out on the street, then may the Lord rebuke you, and may the Lord bring you to destruction, and if he will not bring you to repentance, because you're bringing shame and reproach on the name of Jesus Christ. People look at you and your... The way that you scream at people and berate them, so mean, so nasty. They don't see love, they don't see Jesus. And then they look at me, because I've got like Christian symbols on my shirt and stuff, and I say repent, and I say hell, and I say Jesus, and turn, and all that kind of stuff. I say similar words to you, but it's, in many ways, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Mormons say Jesus, and Mormons say heaven, and, but they mean totally different things. And so when I'm out there... And when I'm preaching the gospel and when I'm talking to somebody, a lot of the time they see you because they've been preconditioned to see you in me and they won't give me a chance. And it grieves me. And so you're basically putting millstones around people's necks when you do that. And the Lord Jesus Christ says that that's a very fearful thing. It might be better for you to, uh, to die early than to you know, have the millstone slung around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea rather than what God's going to do to you if you don't repent of that. So... My final, my final admonition to you is let love be the driving force behind everything you do and don't try to argue yourself out of admonitions like in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Don't try to twist your words and say that, well, just because there's just one thing that doesn't apply or whatever. It's talking about people like us. We need to be at peace with all men insofar as we're able. We need to speak kindly and not quarrel. So I pray that you'll do that. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you with repentance. Amen. All right, now 10 minutes from the other side. One of the biggest problems our brother has is understanding paradox. Every doctrine in the scripture is a paradox, including the doctrine of paradox. Seeming contradictions. Colossians 3, 2 says, put off all anger. But then, Ephesians says, be angry and sin not. Our brother has tripped the treacherous truth trap. It is a booby trap book. Isaiah 28 says that doctrines here little and there a little, line upon line, that they might be taken back and snared. Young man, the Lord has booby-trapped this book to catch the proud in their own craftiness and self prudent And that's exactly what you've done all throughout this whole discussion. Now, you talked about Psalms 51 and how it says that David was shaped in iniquity and uh, conceived in, in sin. And Nahash was David's mother's Husband, well, she was a concubine. And Nahash was an Ammonite king. And if you study Genesis 34, many places, when an Israelite or Hebrew went with a Gentile, they were defiled. 
therefore the birth canal was defiled. And that's what it's talking about. Now, you said, and you took some offense to this, it's on the videotape, and it's too late to go back now. You said during this debate, don't say child of the devil. Don't call people child of the devil. And now you said, I never said that. Well, it's too late to go back now. It is recorded, and you will hear later your mistake you did say. Now, uh, you said, uh, Randy seems to think that I said God preordained sin. I don't teach that. And you do teach that all things come to pass are decreed and commanded by God. Contradiction. You say that John 10, 28 and thereabouts teaches that a man can never perish in some sort of a unconditional eternal security of the perseverance of the saints. There is a condition in the passage. He said, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. You understand? Hearing and following are present tense. When someone is hearing and following, that is faith. Of course, when you walk in the faith, no man's going to pluck you out of his hand. I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm in the hand of the Lord. No man's going to pluck me out of the hand of the Lord. I hear him and I follow him. That is a condition. You reject the conditions of Scripture. You started off in the beginning, quoting from the Apostle Peter, which says, Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you in the heavenly kingdom. If, if is a condition. It's not unconditional. It's conditional. It's conditional election. Now, you stated uh, that I believe, or you misunderstood where I was saying that uh, Philip was saved in the Old Testament sense. You said everybody from, from the Old Testament and New Testament was saved in the exact same way. Not true. In a general sense, and everyone is saved by faith, which is believing God's word, yes. But young men, you need to read your Gospels very carefully. The disciples did not even understand when Jesus said he was going to be killed and resurrected. It says they understood none of these sayings until after the resurrection. Therefore, they could not be saved by the Gospel. Do you understand? How could they be saved by the death, burial, and resurrection if they did not understand? The Gospel is the power of God of salvation. So, we are New Testament Christians. The New Testament in His blood. There is a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, uh, you said that, uh, I, that I believe that one sin and you're lost. Never have I said that. The thoughts never entered to my mind. I've never contemplated maybe even considering such a foolish possibility. I've never told that. You've never heard that come out of my mouth. I told you Hebrews 6, 4-6 through 6 teaches when someone does fall away, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. The Lord will chasten his children. He will plead with his children. He will afflict them. He will do what it takes. That's entirely up to him how long that period is. But if someone dies in their sins, they die in their iniquity and in their sins. Ezekiel talks about that. It says, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and begins to commit all the abominations of the wicked, and I lay a stumbling block before them. In his sin and in his iniquity, he shall die. All of his righteousness shall not be remembered. The Bible speaks in the last warning of the Bible, and our brother here wants to say, well, the basic message is the same with all these translations. No. Messages are comprised of words, and words are vehicles of thought. The devil attacks words. And the last warning in your Bible says, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part from the book of life. The same book of Revelation says, to him that overcometh, to him will I not blot his name out of the book of life. Moses said in Exodus 32, 32, block my name from the book. Why? Because that's impossible? No, it is possible. It only happens once. But one sin, you're lost, and nothing I've ever taught. He says, I defame Christ's character. The problem is, you defame Christ's character. Because you teach that Christ, God Almighty, decreed and commanded every poor inside, every satanic blasphemy, every abortion, every abortion planet, Rape baby, etc. and so on. That is a defamation of the character of Christ. Repent, young man. Repent. Now, um, he says over and over uh, that he is a sinner and that he, that he is uh, uh, that, that he is crazy and evil and little things like that. Uh, he's a very confused young man. Young man, the Bible must be your final forty in all matters of faith and practice. Now you call yourself. Well, we're for Baptists online. I don't know if you changed that. And there is no authority for that in scriptures. No authority to call yourself reformed, although 
Hebrews 9 10 does talk about the time of Reformation. It's talking about the New Testament. The nailing of the ordinances and whatnot upon the cross. The New Testament in his blood. We are part of that Reformation. And we are reformed in that sense. And we are New Testament Christians. But to call yourself Baptist, Reformed Baptist, is very strange. Baptist, baptism is one of the ordinances. The other one is communion. You wouldn't call yourself communionist. You understand? It's just bizarre. Call yourself Christian if you're truly Christian. And you said you don't know if you're elect and you don't think anybody can know if you're elect. That's it's just a, it's not a lot of hope. But call yourself after the name of Christ. That worthy name by which you're called. Now, in closing here, Mr. Miracle, you're in danger of dying in your sin. You said that you sin every day. You, all the warnings of Hebrews and whatnot, you're not taking those admonitions seriously because you do not believe that you can fall away. Of course, you don't even know if you're elect, but if you could reach the point where you realize that you're elect, then you're going to think, well, I'll persevere until the end. And so it's a very miserable existence, but you're in danger of dying in your sins. You're very reckless in your rallying accusations. Your doctrine is very much convoluted, and you defy, defy very basic laws of logic. Your final authority is yourself, because you have no final authority to which you can appeal to. I asked you for just one perfect verse out of 31,102, and you could not. That is sad. You should believe all the counsel of God, and believe the pure words of God that God has provided for you so graciously. And so, sometimes we now, years ago, grasp hold of the doctrine of paradox, allow the Lord to lay out the just weights and balances, and flee from the vain philosophy and high-mindedness of Calvinism and stop maligning God and hiding behind words like compatibilism and things like that. Listen, God did not decree and command every poor inside, every wicked deed and all that. That is a defamation of God's character. Can I overemphasize that? So folks, Alan has not accomplished his mission here. Now, we can certainly say, okay, Moab is my wash pot, here's a man that's called us Children of the devil, we know we're not. We know we're born again, the witness of the Spirit and the testimony of a changed life, the power of the gospel in our lives. We know we're saved, we walk with God, we see God. However, we can take what he said and say, okay, let's make sure that we are walking in the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost will appropriate the various paradoxes. Nothing wrong with that. Moab is my wash pot. This young man, very, as confused as he is, if there's anything we can learn out of this, well, Maybe we should say, you know what, let's make sure that we are walking as good ambassadors of Christ. Let's make sure we're walking in the Holy Ghost with the fruit of the Spirit, etc. and so on. One However, minute. I got one minute? Yes. Okay. However, I just want to say, by saying that, I'm not sympathetic to this spirit. This is Calvinism 101, folks. This has been a field trip to the field and the vineyard of the slothful. Receive instructions, eat, sleep, and drink the King James Bible. Give all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and not to John Calvin. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. All right. Well, that concludes our schedule here. So we'll give you all sufficient time to gather your materials. And Ready, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks for the water. Thank you.